the White House, President Eisenhower signs the proclamation that makes Alaska's entry into the Union official, nearly 92 years after Lincoln's Secretary of State bought the territory from the Russian Tsar for $7 million. The Alaska Wild Project podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. Barney Sports Chalet, supplying hunters with the best hand-selected gear since 1963. The exclusive home of Frontier Gear, built for the rugged Alaskan terrain. Your one-stop shop for all your outdoor needs. Visit Barney's today at 906 West Northern Lights. Arbor Digital, the forefront of digital assets, cryptocurrencies, and wealth management. Providing a low-cost, research-based investment strategy for Alaskans looking to invest their hard-earned money. Visit arborcapital.io today to put your money to work. Tailored Restoration 24-Hour Emergency Home Services. Helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Total Truck and Alaska Overlander, Alaska's premier supplier for custom automotive accessories and overlanding products, providing all-inclusive rental vehicles and trailers custom outfitted to explore the Alaskan backcountry with a unique and convenient traveling experience. Serrano's Mexican Grill, two locations, one on Tudor, one on Northern Lights. The Northern Lights location has their new tequila bar. Check it out. Also see their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. TheTreeHouseAK.com, located at 341 Boniface Parkway, Alaska's own and grown cannabis and CBD store. Ask the bud tender what the strain of the day is to get your 10% off. The Treehouse, where the culture lives. The Connoisseur Lounge, Alaska's premier locally owned and operated cannabis retailer, located in the heart of Palmer, Alaska. Their cultivated products include Snowcap Romance, Aurora Haze, Super Glue, and much more. Find them at theconnoisseurlounge.net. AKO Farms, located in Sitka, Alaska, built from the ground up with concentrates as their single motivation, with exclusive products such as their sugar wax, full spectrum diamond sauce cards, and more. Ask your local bud tender about AKO. Marijuana has intoxicating effects and may be habit forming and addictive. Marijuana impairs concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence. There are health risks associated with consumption of marijuana. For the use of only by adults 21 and over. Keep out of the reach of children and marijuana should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. The Bait Shack. Located on Ship Creek upstream of the bridge. Can't miss the bright red shack. They are the go-to fishing gear rental and guide service on Ship Creek tight lines and fish on come hook into the action with them hit them up at thebaitshackak.com anchor town dogs located on fourth avenue across from the old fourth avenue theater look for the blue and gold umbrella from reindeer dogs to bomb euros they've got you covered anchor town dogs your local gourmet hot dog and sausage cart Crude Magazine, Alaska-based media outlet using the last frontier as a springboard to discover larger truths about the cultures of our great state. Read more at crudemag.com. Lawn Pro AK, Alaska's year-round professional property maintenance team. Services include snow and ice management, weekly lawn care, and more. Get your free estimate today at lawnproak.com. Double Shovel Cider Company, located off of Arctic and 58th, handcrafted Alaskan-made colonial ciders. They also have a tap room downtown on the corner of 5th and E. Stop by today and taste an award-winning cider. Lady with a Plan, your own Alaska event planner. From scouting the perfect location to planning the tiniest details, specializing in event management and production for intimate social gatherings. Find Lady with a Plan on Instagram. Yeah, you want, like... I think it's cool if you pick this show up and you just want to randomly listen to it wherever. It's 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 great. Like support, listen, get into it. But I think from the beginning is the best because you can you can hear the whole culmination. Yeah, that is what it's been. The story, man. Yeah, yeah, and we'd like to believe it's like polished out a little bit more. What was the and homie who came and said he started over? Start at the beginning. Uh, Josh. Josh. Yeah, the okay. uh, the the dude in total. Uh, down at total truck there and uh, that's a commitment man i was like damn he's yeah like i think he's i think he's on like 12 so that would be what the one right after yours yeah that'd be dana i think uh 
Dana came in and told us about his uh, his his uh, Mount Denali climb. But, oh, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's cool because man, it was it was a little choppy there for a few weeks, you know, trying to figure <laughs> figure out things, you know. Yeah, it's cool. Like someone can really see the progression of there you know is. the show mm-hmm. and you guys and guests yeah. and yeah, yeah. And people feel like they. Uh, I was I was talking to my my parents about it the other day, and they randomly. They're, they've been camping and they're like at Bing's Landing this past weekend fishing and, and my dad's just like fishing next to this girl and and she's like, yeah, you know, I'm going back and they're just chatting, chatting and she's like, he's like, oh, you just drove by yourself. She's like, yeah, I just put a podcast on and listen and he's like, oh, which one? And she's like, Alaska Wild Project. And my dad's like, oh, really? That's my son's. And she was just like blown away. Like, she's like, what? Oh, my God. Go figure. <laughs> yeah, they're just standing next to her on the bank. Yeah. Yeah. Just so <laughs> random. You know, like two months ago, my dad didn't even know what a podcast was. You know, so it's just like, okay, well, let's go. <laughs> and the random guy came up when I was at the sh- at the Derby. Um, shout out to Dustin at the Bait Shack, man. What a good event he put on over there for the Ship Creek Coho oh, Derby. Um, it was just a one day, seven to seven um biggest fish smallest fish and then the most <laughs> weight for three fish so you could get your limb at all three and then whoever's stringer like weighed the most you know would win the prizes and he had all kind of prizes and yeti coolers and cash and all kind of stuff going out um so i went down there with mateo and uh we're fishing and just this random dude comes up and just i love the podcast man i was like all right cool man i had a shirt or something on and that was just that was awesome. That's a good feeling. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, it's cool when people randomly, yeah, check it out or ask. Yeah, what is that? Yeah, I see your guys. I saw a guy at Costco the other day rocking your hoodie. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. Neat. Put yep. that up a little bit more there. I was at <laughs> I was at <laughs> Iditarod <laughs> signups, uh-huh. and I ran into <clears throat> a listener, and I, I don't know. I think he's maybe been on the show as well. Okay. And he goes, hey, you're Eddie. I know who you are, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and okay. Yeah, I know he's friends with you. Oh, Daniel. okay. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, and funny. he's sponsoring a musher. Oh, really? Yep. Hmm. Oh. I wonder who that is. So, I'm not sure. I I forget his name. That's all right. But, yeah. Cool guy. Connected to it somehow, some way, yeah. right? Oh, man. I, I was like, AWP, man, blowing up. Yeah, it, man. yeah. Oh, speaking of that. Worldwide. Oh. oh. I'm, I'm, I didn't even got one ready, man. Oh, there, there we go. There it goes. There it goes. Oh, you guys already have yours open. I'll catch up later. Okay. I'll catch up later. I'll catch up later. Welcome to Alaska Wild Project, episode 76. Um, today we have Eric Corman and Eddie Burke in the house. Thanks for coming out, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, we just wanted to get these guys in here to catch up and talk about uh, you know some of the plans we got coming in for for the uh, hunting season and catch up a lot with uh, Eddie. Um, most of you haven't uh, gone back and listened to some of the old episodes. Eddie Burke is a uh, up and coming. Um, Dog sled musher. I wouldn't say up and coming anymore. I think you're there now. You're established. Established musher. Uh, you were one of our first guests episode, what did I say, 11? 11. 11. Mm-hmm. Long time ago. Long yep. time. Two yeah. years. Two years. When yeah, we it doesn't feel like it, but I guess when you were mentioning it before the show, damn, I guess it was that. Time's long. flying, man. Yeah. yeah. People yeah. love that episode too, man. Yeah. It was, that, that was really? Yeah. yeah. People love that episode. You know, I mean- it's, dog mushing is just not a very well known thing. You know, mm-hmm. people aren't very knowledged about it's like it. It's wildly or, popular or, in yeah, that sense, right? There's not like a huge interest, it seems like, among the, you know, day to day general public, r- regular Joe. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. So I, I never know how it's going to go over, you know, but I mean, yeah, that's good feedback to, it's good to hear that people are interested and enjoy yeah. listening. I think it's one of those where it's like it's not in your mind until it's you know i did a rod time or you see someone practicing Mm -hmm. somewhere like running their dogs and you're like Mm -hmm. oh man there's people out here doing this you know actually doing this all the time it still exists (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. and actually you know i i um i worked for rondy and i did a rod this last year and it kind of been going downhill i would say as far as like there's many people that were there but this last year was cracking dude yeah it was popping yeah it was going on man And the willows restart was uh was a big event too there's a lot of people down there big turnout kind of like how it used to feel maybe years yeah i mean it seems like the willow start is always pretty popular i mean and then because it turns into like a party you know Mm -hmm. you got 
everybody on Willow Lake and then... Is that where it is, Willow Lake? Yep, and then Mm. people that have cabins up and down that, you know, that trail system there. Oh, I'll come out and watch. I'll come out and they post up, you know, on the lakes or on the river and, you know, set up camp. They got tiki bars and... Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Bonfires and... That's so it, it it's a pretty cool pretty cool turnout. Yeah, it's definitely not dead. It's I think it, dead. I actually no, no, think no, no. it's like resurging. Yeah. I feel like there's yeah. an interest there. I don't know if it's just like younger um I wouldn't say millennials, but younger Alaskans. It's a generation shift. Are like, man, that's actually kind of cool. Yeah. Like there was a gap there where maybe none of us our age wanted to get into it. No. But then, like, the next generation, like, Eddie's Eddie's age and all that, like, they're like, man, this is actually kind of cool. And then, you know, the ki- kids have always been into watching dogs racing and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's cool to see that it's, like, bouncing back. Hopefully you get some more uh, big, like, corporate sponsors and people to throw some more money at it because that's the, probably what it needs. That's what it's lacking, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On the On the bigger corporate level. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see uh, what the future is for I did a rod, but hopefully it'll be around for many years to come. I'd like to, you know, keep competing. Yeah. You know, at the top level. I mean, that's the biggest race in the world. So yeah. If that dies, it's sad, sad day for yeah. for dog mushing. You know, and I mean, there's still plenty of other competitive and you know lucrative races around the state and around the world. You know, like the Cusco 300, the Kobuk 440. There's the Finnmark, you know, over in Norway. And, mm. you know, you have That'd races. Awesome. You have races in the lower 48 that are extremely popular. But still, I, I did a rod is the, it's the Super Bowl. It's the big one. Canada, yeah. Canada doesn't have big. Yeah, it was about to ask oh, that. That's such yeah, a big. I, I think they got some races. And then plus there's the Yukon <coughs> Quest that goes through mm-hmm. Canada. But then oh, okay. now they got some politics you know that have yeah. kind oh, of uh, yeah, yeah. that have disrupted you, that so you put your mask on as soon as you cross the border <laughs> well <laughs> so <laughs> now they uh they broke it up the i guess the yukon quest board on the alaska side broke away they they've separated from the yukon quest board of canada so now they're both doing their own separate races so i mean uh, it's cool to see that they're putting something together Mm-hmm. And keeping it alive somehow. Yeah, they got a race, and I think they're going to have a hundred thousand dollar purse here on the Alaska side. Oh wow! They're going to do a five hundred and fifty wow. mile race. Oh my right god! Right on. So I believe the plan is for them to go start in Fairbanks, take the original route, and then it goes from Eagle, and then from Eagle off to Toke finishes in Toke. Mm. So you start in Fairbanks and go all the way to Toke. And you're planning, if it goes on, you're going to do it? You want to do it? It is it a qualifying thing? I So I, I have all my qualifiers. Okay. And uh, I got that my first year. Yep. First year of racing, I got all three qualifiers in. But it's kind of more of a, uh, a scheduling conflict, you know, because I like to do, you know, start fall training in September train all the way till Cusco, which is late January, and then race race in that, give the dogs some time off, rebuild, and then get them peaking for Iditarod, which is first weekend of March. Mm. So if you throw in another race first week of February, that's the the timing of uh, the quest. It, it doesn't oh, really work okay. out. you got to choose. It, so I would have to not do the Cusco, but, I mean, the Cusco is kind of – the initial for me the the best setup for I did I mean that can be argued you know but in my opinion in it, yeah. it, it's a race where you can go win 20 grand yep you know yeah there's yeah. some incentive yeah yeah and it, I mean you got the best dog drivers around the world competing at that race and it, mm. it it's 300 miles on only 10 hours of rest <sighs> so you got back to back 90 mile runs yeah, yeah. Just so I, hard. I, yeah no, I mean you drop the hammer. You're mm-hmm. you're keeping it in the red. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> I mean it's that's a lot. I, I, I took the the dogs there to that to the Cusco um, this past winter, and we competed there. And yeah, no, it was kind of blew my mind. Yeah, but, I mean it was a lot of fun. And, and you know what they're capable of now? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. No, it was a, it was a good test for them. Good test for myself. I mean 
dogs and myself learned a lot. Yeah. Well, let's backtrack and how was the 2022, 21-22 season? Like, how, how did you do in the races and all that? Which all did you enter and how'd you do? So, this past winter, I I entered into the first race of the season was January 1st. And that was the Connect 200. Okay. The Joe Reddington Connect 200. And it's that's a race that's been around for a long time. There's quite a few uh, co- real competitive I did rod mushers. I mean, you know top five, top 10 consistent type mushers. So as far as the, um, competition, it was, there was no shortage. Um, I was actually was in second place for, um, I think up until like mile 80 or 80 something, you know, it's basically two back to back 90 something mile runs. Okay. And I think I was in second place up to like, you know, mile 90 something. And then I went into some open water oh. team fell through the ice. It was, you know, oh, it, it turned into a real bad situation. And then, uh, I got stuck there for about an hour helping, you know, just one, trying to get myself out two mm. trying to get other teams across. And so, I mean, I gave up over an hour's worth of time there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, so it allowed a bunch of other teams to catch up and, you know, helping them across and whatever. So kind of being competitive at that point kind of went out the window. It was kind yeah, of more safety of a, first there. It was yeah. kind of more of a, you know, hey, let's You're kind of get everybody, together. Let, let's get through this, you know, that type of thing. And then um, there was this mandatory six-hour layover uh, there at the Sheep, Sheep Creek Lodge in Willow. Okay. And then uh, we took off again. And so there's time differentials, you know, obviously. So with letting those guys catch up and me spending an hour in the water and dogs getting, you know, I mean, it's just kind of a not a pleasant situation to be in, you know, and no dogs were hurt or anything like that. Everybody came out of it good and um, finished the race real strong. But um, I ended up taking fourth in that race against, you know, I, it was real close too. I mean, yeah. I think – Second place was only like 15 minutes or something ahead of me. Well, it wasn't someone that it was you tight. helped, was it? Um, it was, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. You, you know, <laughs> so I, third place, yeah, someone that I helped. And yeah, um, he, he finished like 10 minutes, eight minutes or something like that ahead of me. Yeah. You know, but I mean, I was there on a, on a training run. Oh, okay. So it, yeah. it, 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 this past year wasn't about winning races is just kind of up in the competition for my dogs and showing them more of a, a competitive race schedule. Yeah. So, you know, I wasn't there to win it by any means. Just go run it and it, see how it goes. Yeah. I mean, I was definitely in a good position to, to be right there and yeah. the dogs look great and they finished strong and they looked awesome, but, um, obviously that's, screwing. That's the one we went and watched you finish, yeah. right? Yeah. Dude, you guys are G's cause that was the windstorm. Right yep. when it was seventy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they're out fucking the river, and that was when there was howling out there. Yeah, these guys are all night long running the in river. The wind? Yeah, and that wind. I mean, blown just, semi trailers off yeah, the road. Yeah, and yeah. They're yeah. Like just thinking about him out there in the dark, just running. Yeah, big I mean, oh was that God. like around New Year's? Yeah, yeah, it yeah, was. It was, January, it was right? New yep. Year's weekend. Mm-hmm. I mean, the wind was so strong that it was picking my sled up off the trail. And blowing me. So my sled's 150 pounds. I'm probably 180 with my gear on. Yeah. I mean, picking us up, blowing us off the trail into the snow. That's how strong the winds I were. I forgot you guys were racing that. And weekend. those dogs it was were bad. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was bad. That was That's really crazy. Well, I drove out to the storm. valley that day to pick up the new trailer, yeah, and did. I turned right back <laughs> around, dude. One of them, like, uh, sheds, like, when, right when you get into Wasilla and the dude has, like, all the yep. sheds that he builds, dude, there's, like, one rolling across the highway. I'm like, oh, man, fuck this. And I just turned around, and then I see yeah, the semi get rolled over in, in front of me, and another dude with the enclosed trailer, the thing's, like, on its side, like, just any minute about to tip over, and then it did. I just went around. I was like, I got to get out of here. Yeah, that was so bad. Went back home, and that was it. I was like, this is not weather to be outside in. No, it was wicked. Or or but the dogs, <laughs> yeah. dogs were just flying Fuck. through it. I mean, just charging, and yeah. it it was a beautiful, beautiful thing to see until I went to that open water. But um, yeah, it was a badass race. So yeah. we did that. We finished good. Um, 
Yeah, the wind was crazy. Yeah, I mean, going through the blowhole, I guess it was supposedly blown 70 plus miles an hour through there. Yeah, and hurricane I mean, shit. I couldn't see my wheel dogs, you know, and those are the dogs closest to you. So, I mean, I couldn't see a thing. And it was just like, you know, when you're. It means they couldn't see anything either. When I'm, you know, when I went to go speak to like give my dogs a command, I, I mean, I couldn't even hear myself. Oh, the you know, it was sound. just just screaming. So, you know, I just kind of, you know, straight ahead, guys, and just hunkered down on the back of my sled, and off we went. And just, I mean, the do- it didn't phase the dogs a bit, and that's just how incredible they are and the trust that they have in me mm-hmm. and just the bond and relationship, and that's kind of my favorite thing about it. But Do they, kind of, do you think they, they just kind of sniff the trail? They know the trail? Yeah. Yeah. They, they can sniff it out, and also with their with their uh, footing, you know, they can feel. Oh, feel. if they're kind of off trail, and then yeah, they're in the, the back. beaten path, and then they'll and they'll search for it. Yep. Okay. Oh, that's so cool. they're feeling it. Oh yeah. Yeah, they had to be in the wind because if it was dark and blowing, and then they were difficulty hearing your commands. They had to have been just like winging. Oh yeah, it. they're they're doing their job. They're doing what they're trained yep. to do. What they're bred. Straight I ahead. mean, it's just natural instincts for them. So. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the beautiful thing about mushing. It's everything is there in them, you know, and and Mm -hmm. we're just kind of there to coach it along. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we did the Kinnick. And then after the Kinnick, we went to the Cusco 300. So that's in Bethel. And uh, we flew out there uh, thanks to Northern Air Cargo. They're a kennel sponsor and um, took care of us, shipped the dogs out there and competed in Bethel. We ran a 40-hour race, which is considered usually a top five to top three kind of finish time. And uh, But it was just such a highly competitive and fast race. I ended up finishing 12th, but that was my goal was to run a 40-hour race. Yeah. And that's what we went up there, and we, we accomplished that. Dogs finished great. And then from there, um, the next race we did was the Kobuk 440. And that's at a Cot- Kotzebue. Okay. And so you go from Kotzebue to this year, they alternate routes. So this year we went to Selwick. Okay. Or it, go- it goes from Kotzebue to Norvik to Selwick, then to Ambler, then from Ambler to uh, Shungnak and Kobuk, and then back to Ambler. And then you go from Ambler to Kiana, and then Kiana to Norvik. But Norvik is just kind of a blow-through checkpoint. And um, no one really stops there. Okay. You know? You're just blown through. So it's actually, what, four 90-mile runs in one set. The shortest run of that race is 70 miles. And then it ended up snowing a foot on us. It was blowing. Mm. I mean, there wasn't a trail in sight. And But really tough race. Um, you go through the heart of the Brooks Range. I mean, beautiful scenery, herds oh, of caribou man. everywhere, yeah. wolverines. I mean, just wildlife. Really? And yeah. I mean, you're out in God's country. For and sure. It does look uh, badass out there, huh? It, it it really is. And it's April, so mm, there's some daylight. You're, you're, yeah, there's. I barely use my headlamp. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's kind of crazy up there. Um, And it's like, I don't know, probably 50 degrees in the sunlight during the day. Oh, yeah. nice. And then at night, I mean, we had temperature swings of like negative 40 and oh, then man. like 30 mile an hour winds. You know, uh-huh. it's just so the weather, it's so inconsistent. You know, it's all over the place. So yeah. one run, it's beautiful it's like and some sunny. shit on another planet sometimes, the way yeah. it'll do that kind of stuff. And then you're all sweaty and you're soaking wet and you just been out on the trail for 10 hours and then next thing you know it's like 30 below and mm. then the wind's blowing and it's snowing a foot and you're like what the hell <laughs> yeah what am i doing <laughs> <laughs> just sleep piled up with your dogs just like <laughs> yeah but they they killed it up there you know and i we we had a phenomenal time the, traveling through the villages is one of the most incredible things the people the villagers the support that you get i mean i don't know they're standing out there in these storms and cold and holding making signs for you and yeah had got caribou stew made and Mm -hmm. you know just tons of love yeah all throughout the villages there in that kotzebue region and is there musher groupies 
Musher groupies? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> out there, I, yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot of fans. That's for sure. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm focused. Uh, okay, okay. Right. <laughs> she Just throwing out high fives and thank you. Yep. No, no time for... for uh, Extracurriculars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we took third place in that one. Oh, After nice. Party. And I think I, I think I won ten grand. And oh, right on. You know, took third place and dogs did awesome. And I, you know, racing against once again a lot of top Iditarod mushers, guys that were in this year's Iditarod top five. You know, several of them. Um, so to I guess go up there with with a lot of my young guys that I've been training and building mm. and to compete with some of the best dog teams in the world yeah, and take third place in what's considered one of the most toughest races in the world um, was a damn good feeling. So oh, yeah. I ended the season on a really good note. I think I, you know, showed what my dog team's capable of, what I'm capable of as, as a dog man. And um, it was a good learning experience for, for myself, for my dogs, our kennel program everything you know it was yeah just an all-around good experience well we were talking about it before the show too now rewinding back what two years or so when you were here last and that the, the the first i guess level in your progression of your mushing how everything's gone to schedule yeah and how that's how it's that's how success is built in mushing it seems like you can't just like be a loaded ass rich guy and be like, I just want to mush and I'm gonna get all the best trainers and dogs. I'm gonna get all stuff together and I can get on the trail and just do it. It's like, no, it doesn't work. That you got to actually like build it over a course of time. So it takes, it takes about three years to finally get a race team that you can be competitive with. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm at right now. I yep. got it. You know, yep. I'm at a, age of three-year-olds okay with the dog so it's been a process you know for the past three years building these guys up as two-year-olds we took them to their first dog race and then as three-year-olds we went and stepped it up in competition and now there'll be four-year-olds mm. and now it's like it's yeah they're it's, mature they're fully all they're fully adults. grown yep. yep so now it's like okay you're ready for a thousand mile race you're ready to actually yeah. go yep. to cusco and like try to run a winning schedule you know, yeah. now we're ready to go to Kobuk. They're actually to, like almost a veteran-ish yeah. level, right? And, you know, so now we can go to these races and actually really try to run a, a winning pace. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. Hopefully, I mean, so far, everything has gone to plan. We've had great success, early success. Um, but I think that's just dog team, the program that I'm a part of. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it takes a lot. You know, it's a group effort. You know, yeah. oh, I bet, I bet. Is there a uh, what's like a retirement age for like a dog? So usually they're kind of end of their prime is from, I guess you could say three to seven. Okay. You know, really four to seven is like peak racing age, mm -hmm. and then after seven you got a real badass, maybe eight years old, nine. Not unheard of, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but after that, yeah, retirement, yeah. run tours, you know. Yeah, they're still healthy young nature dogs but as far as yep. running them that hard in those conditions it's like because they'll live to 17 16 sure. you know yeah. i mean it, these sled dogs live to pretty old age for a large breed mm -hmm. you know a lot of large breeds kind of start fading out after yeah. oh, 10, 10, 10, 10 years to, man it dog falls 12. apart yep 10 yeah. to 12 years but these guys are incredible athletes and you would think after running multiple thousand mile races yeah they'd be and, broke more broke down but they're they're just cruising around. Is is uh, Blunt still the lead dog? Blunty boy, Blizzy. man. Yeah. Actually, Big Bl Blizzy. <laughs> Blizzy's a daddy. Oh, he is? Oh, yeah, yeah for, for the second time. So I have... Oh, shit. So I got Swenson, which is one of his sons. Um, and he's uh, he actually finished in lead in the Cusco. I mean, like, that dog stepped it up. Blunt got hurt, and I was kind of short on lead dogs. Mm. I had a couple of injuries happen. They call it the Bermuda Triangle at, at the at the Cusco, and it's in between Kalskag and Tulisac. It's basically on your way to the last checkpoint. And, I mean, shit just started going Everything was south. falling apart. Yep. Yeah. It just, I was like, what? The, you know, dog stepped in an ice crack. Boom. Injury. Down. Basically, I rolled into Tulisac with three dogs in my sled. 
<laughs> you know, just carrying them. Yeah. Oh man. And you know, it's obviously got the best interest for them. You know, I'm not. Yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah. They they show, hey, they got something a little tweaked. All right, going on. And I side. imagine you, they can still run, and they would, but you, yeah. you don't want to take the chance, and you don't no. want to put them through any harm, right? Because like, they could all continue to run. But what does that do for them in the future? Mm-hmm. You know, everything's yeah. kind of long term. Oh yeah, yeah. It's all so game. you know, I'm thinking next year, year after. So, um, but yeah, we hit the Bermuda Triangle and things fell apart. But yeah, Blizzy's son Swenson stepped it up, took us all the way to the finish line. But yeah, Blunt just had. You didn't call him Roach. <laughs> uh, yeah, Blunt just had an, another set of pups, so I got four males out of them. Oh, that's oh, good. Wow. So yeah, I got four pups, and so the next gen. Yeah, the is future. there? Oh, I never even thought about that. Is do you do they only run males? No, I I got like a fifty fifty mix. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it feels like if you have all one. You know, you have one set of girls, one set of boys. You probably have some more, like, bullshit happening between them, right? I imagine if the female-male mix helps balance out attitudes and stuff, right? It, it it can actually honestly be a pain in the ass, especially, like, with females in heat. Oh, mm. yeah. I mean, you just, yeah. you can imagine a bunch of team, you know, six, seven, eight, whatever, how many males you got, horny dogs over just one female. And even the females start to get goofy. Right. Like, I don't know. That smells good. <laughs> 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 Let's get weird. Yeah. You know? yeah right. <laughs> Is there a, a favorite? I mean, you've, you've been so many places around Alaska where, I mean, I'm a lifelong Alaskan, Eric, Brandon, and probably many people that are listening that have never been to, you know, not even a third of all these villages and these places that you go to. Is there a certain stretch that you feel is like your favorite? Like it's just like the most beautiful to you for whatever reason. And then the flip side of the question, is there just one gnarly section where like, ah, I got to go do the whatever, the Bermuda Triangle or some (laughs) other gully they, or something it's it's kind of each race has its own set of challenges and of course you get out anywhere i mean just get a few miles off the road system and that's kind of the great thing about alaska you get a few miles off the road system and you're out in no man's land you yeah. know just beautiful country yep doesn't take long it doesn't take that long so every race got its has its own special parts beautiful scenery um some more than others of course but i'd say overall my favorite race is probably the kobuk Mm. and bethel is a close second the scenery isn't as great but it's more flat up there yeah it's just kind of a lot of river running okay um and you go through some portages and twisty turny type stuff and some treat areas and but it's a lot of just wide open and river running and um which i mean that that cusco river i mean is i mean it's beautiful and it's travels through some great parts you know the state obviously um but that as far as just a competitive type of race and the people and the villagers and the support that's out there because i mean dog mushing is huge in bethel oh, and yeah. throughout that that region you know um all the way out to antioch that's where we we uh that's kind of the furthest point that we go out is to antioch mm. and then it turns around and then comes back do you think um actually for a question for all you guys do you think mm. if you know is would you say the Iron Dog is bigger or like the I, I did a rod? Because that's like the two biggest races, right? Yeah. So it's, I mean, this is just kind of my opinion. It, it seems like there's more people that turn out to the uh, to the I did a rod start there in Willow than the Iron Dog start in Big Lake. But it seems like people are maybe the Iron Dog racers are a little more like well known. Then, mm. you know, I think people follow maybe Iditarod or uh, Iron Dog a mm. little bit more, you know, pay a little closer attention or kind of actually know them. And yeah, it Isn't seems it like th- it seems like there's a better connection, like with the actual public. Isn't Iditarod yeah. more worldwide, though? Followers that watch this dog race over 
I don't know. I'm, I'm just yeah. I, don't, I guess it's a pretty broad question, but just yeah, in I, general, because me and Brandon went to the um, the start of the uh, Iron Dog this year, and it seemed like it was going on. It was a lot of people, and it, but not not crazy. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't say thousands of people. I'd say hundreds of people were there. Um, so no, maybe this year we go to either. we go to the Willow Start and see what yeah what that's looking. And I like. mean, there's there's a couple thousand people out there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's. It, so that's what I was saying. There's there's more people I think that show up to the Iditarod starts, and I think there's probably more people that maybe follow it. But when you're here in Alaska and you're kind of mixing around the general public, it seems like there's more people that know like Iron Dog racers, yeah. and know a little more about them than they do mushers. Yeah, mm, I wonder if that's like a marketing. So thing. I I just think there's a little better connection with like. The public and especially like the younger crowd, you know, everybody's like, oh, yeah, you know, because a lot of these iron dog races, they live and work here in Anchorage and, you know. Yeah. Well, I, and I would say also a lot more people probably snow machine than, exactly. than ride, fl- than ride than run dogs, yeah. you know, yeah, just in course. general, like, yeah. you know, probably at least one in five guys, you know, you know, rides a sled. Oh, totally. So they obviously will know, have a little bit more interest in the iron dog versus like you might know one out of a thousand or more yeah. people, people that know lance sled mackey <laughs> or you know yeah. dallas cv they they know a couple of names but other than that you know yeah that's you kind of hit it on the head i i think that connection with the general public is probably more prevalent with mm-hmm. iron dog but i'd say statewide in terms of like everybody knows when i did rods coming it's during Ferrand day yep. it's like a it's an annual like milestone thing that's like in alaska every time iron dog to me just kind of comes and goes and you know we're we're one of the biggest supporters in trying to see both of these sports kind of regain their popularity and the health of the sport we Mm -hmm. would love to see these new generations in these like an, an uptick in like the growth of it from maybe it's like steady decline to some degree but to answer your question i really do think that iditarod is certainly more popular okay um just traditionally in alaska and it's more well known and like probably internationally saying, it, you it's know a, it's a it's, worldwide it's, yeah it, it's huge over in europe you know and especially in the northern countries mm-hmm. i mean it's got a big following so. yeah 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 I, I mean i'm pretty sure it's got to be a fact you know yeah and there are like iron dog is similar racing is similar there's different races all over the place different times of year that are annual races too like like i did a rod but um i'm kind of wondering too if like the qualifying i'm trying to remember when we had team 10 we had them boys in here and like the qualifying process seems more rigorous with i did a rod in terms of like the plan and, and how you or build the, the team well, and I all mean. of it it's just like it takes so much more yeah, yeah to build it it's not just you it's you trying to train 14 dogs yeah you know and then it's all the scenarios and situations i mean you got to learn to be a outdoorsman a survivalist Mm -hmm. a a veterinarian veterinarian you know a a dog Mm. trainer and then also an athlete and you need to know i guess obviously how to navigate through just wilderness you know some of the toughest terrain in alaska challenge dude and you're relying on dogs to get you there, you know, not just yeah, not a throttle and nothing to take away from obviously iron dog racers. I mean, those guys are, it's badass what they do. And mm-hmm. I mean, those guys are flying and, oh, yeah. um, it takes a special breed to do that as well. You know, and I mean, they're encountering a, a lot of elements out there as yeah, well, yeah. but there's, I've done a lot of snow machining in my day. And there's a big difference between getting in 70 mile an hour winds and a fresh foot of snow on a dog team than it is, you know, grabbing a handful of gas on a snow go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's a little more comforting on a snow machine than it is, you know. Yeah, I bet, I bet. Hey, buddy. Yep. Get, a, get on up there. <laughs> I know it's about a foot deep, you know, but uh, let's keep moving. <laughs> Just plowing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what would you say is like the average uh, speed? Like when you're in one of these races, um, I, I'm sure the terrain matters, but terrain, like, let's say trail, like, all of it. But basically where we try to travel at is like 10 miles an hour. Okay. And we, I mean, 
and 10 miles an hour for, you know, like the Cusco, uh, that race has been won at almost like an average of 11 miles an hour, back to back 90s, you know, I mean, which is incredible running 10 and a half miles an hour for a hundred miles straight and then resting two to three hours and then getting up and going again and doing it all over. It's just insane. And that's like in the Kobuk. I mean, it's four 90 mile runs in the 70. That's, in, that's just, you can't even think over of like, it's, it's like hard know? to like, even like, yep. imagine. I'm going to sit back here and cheer you on. Yeah. And live vicariously <laughs> through what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's take a quick break and we'll come right back. Yeah. Barney Sports Chalet, supplying hunters with the best hand selected gear since 1963. Barney specializes in supplying hunters with the absolute best Alaskan proven gear on the market for some of nature's most rugged and demanding terrain. Whether you're headed to the remote volcanic islands of the Alaska Peninsula in search of a brown bear or the shale infested glacial valleys of the Brooks Range for dull sheep, it is critical you choose the right gear for your dream hunt. Don't miss Barney's exclusive brand, Frontier Gear of Alaska, tested from the high mountains of Tajikistan to the extreme conditions of Alaska. These products were designed for high performance and durability. Frontier Gear was derived from decades of experience hunting big game in Alaska. Paired with other top brands, it provides you the absolute best gear selection anywhere in the world. Stop in at Barney Sports Chalet in Anchorage on Northern Lights or check out their custom website and reference tool at barneysports.com. Arbor Capital. Arbor Capital is based in Anchorage, Alaska, and it's your go-to wealth management company. Arbor Capital is at the forefront of digital assets and cryptocurrencies. If you've been looking to invest your hard-earned money, or you just want to learn more about crypto, blockchain technology, or digital investments, give their website, arborcapital.io, a visit. What's great about Arbor is they provide a low-cost, transparent, research-based investment strategy for digital assets and traditional investments as well. ArborCapital.io is your first step in putting your money to work. Let one of Arbor's investment professionals walk you through your options for financial growth and security. Start investing for the future today at ArborCapital.io. Arbor Capital, your Alaska digital asset company. Total Truck and Alaska Overlander, Alaska's premier supplier for custom automotive accessories and overlanding products, providing all-inclusive rental vehicles and trailers custom outfitted to explore the Alaskan backcountry with a unique and convenient traveling experience. At Total Truck, you can find brands such as ARE, RSI Smart Caps, Goose Gear, iCamper, Front Runner, Rigid Lights, Rhino Linings Bed Liners, and everything you need to outfit your truck or SUV. Alaska Overlander provides 4x4 vehicles and expedition trailers custom modified for Alaskan adventures and outfitted with rooftop tents, fridges, and all the camping and cooking gear you need to start exploring. Visit them at alaskaoverlander.com. Finish it at like a certain, you know, first place. It's like, doesn't matter, right? You're just trying to get there and make sure everybody's alive. Yeah, it's something, yeah. you know. Yeah, it, it kind of becomes that. Yeah, you know, depending on the situation you get into, the, the race is a byproduct of survival. Yeah, it becomes survival <laughs> mode, and some of these storms are, you know, yeah. different elements that you encounter mm -hmm. out there. Yeah, it's wild, man. So for twenty twenty three, um, the next racing season, you plan to do all the same races? So it'll be Cusco, mm -hmm. end of January. Then we move into Iditarod first weekend of March. So my rookie run. And then we'll next year's your, this coming up is your rookie run. Yep. Yeah, you're oh, man. you're one at it. Yep. Oh yeah. So yeah. Cusco, I did a ride, and then we go to Kobuk, and we finish the season off. The so Kobuk three are, main yep. races is what you're going, and those are just the, all the big boys. Yeah. So okay, that's what that's what I'm focused on. Mm -hmm. Want to compete at the highest level. Yep. Um, and against the best mushers. So January. End of January, then we, a month later, move right into Iditarod. Then after Iditarod, we got about two to three weeks of a break, and the dogs get about 10 days off, and then we start slowly stretching them out, getting them built back up, and then, boom, we fly out to, to Kotzebue, and we go race the Kobuk. Nice. And then after that, it's season's over. Dogs chill out, relax, heal yeah. up, have fun. They can lick their wounds. Relax all summer, and then I'll get back to it, and it'll be this exact same schedule 
for the following year. Okay. And then I <clears throat> got to come back to Anchorage and work away all summer. And I was going to say, it doesn't sound like McKenna boys are keeping you too relaxed <laughs> during the summertime. <laughs> No. no, summertime's full Phone throttle. Just ringing yeah. like, oh my god. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, we've been talking about wanting to go to the finish of the I did a rod. I don't know if this year will be the year to do it. I'd yeah, it would definitely is on the list. A good one but at too. least we can do the Willow beginning. I mean, I've seen the start yeah. in Anchorage all the time, kind of because I'm working. You know, it's not. Is that at the enjoyable? Deshka? Or Willow Lake, you said? Yeah. It Willow used to Lake. be at Deshka, though, right? So they did it one year at, at Deshka because Willow Lake had a ton of overflow on it. Oh, um, okay. It, because of all the heavy snowfall mm -hmm. and, you know. So yeah. it was just a big slush fest out there. Mm. So they moved it to Deshka Landing, and it actually ended there at Deshka Landing as well. It's when they – that was covid 2021 yep, it mm -hmm. sure was shut it out of the villages so they did oh. the gold trail loop they went all the way to iditarod which is an old abandoned mining town yep and uh ran it all the way out to iditarod and turned around and came all the way back so they actually went through the uh the alaska range twice wow mm. so that was that stretch yeah through the P rainy pass and back through yep through mm. the gorge and yeah wicked yeah, pretty gnarly. No, we'll definitely go attend the, the start. I know we talked about the, the finish, and um, I know I think we have, like, a potential like family vacation that might be transpiring. Well, if I finish good, your asses better be there. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I know I know that you're, like, management and the whole family, and I know, you know, Kennedy's excited about going up there and watching the finish. Yep. And so we were, like, kind of planning this, like, tentative – family vacation is like falls right on that time mm -hmm. and then you know we straight up let her decide she's like hey do you want to come with us on the trip or are you going to want to go up to Nome and watch the the race and she's like oh dad i want to go watch a race i'm like i was so happy for her i was like i didn't want her to feel like she was like in a weird spot to make a decision yeah i wanted her to do what she wanted to do and she wants to come up and watch the the end of the race well, oh shit i didn't even you know should, that. you should be proud That's of her cool, man, man. I, i'm proud of her i was like cool man she's like she is like diehard fan Damn. Like she is like a hard, hardcore supporter of you. So well, that right there, well, I know the whole motivation. family. There you go. I know the whole there family lo is loves what you're doing too, and you know they we're all behind you for sure. Like Eric, I mean, you guys came out, you know, the connect. Yeah. Yeah, I never yeah. watched this in my life until he started doing it. Yeah. He yeah. started like, getting on my phone and tracking. I'm like, oh, shit, he's doing good. Go to yep. bed at night and see where he's at and look at the GPS tracker. You know? Yeah, man. Oh, they have cool. everyone track like that so yeah. you can see where you they're get at? online and see exactly where they're at. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's mm. pretty cool. So, yeah, for all these races, usually there's a – you have a tracker on your sled, and so, you know, friends, family, fans, and all that can keep – That's dope. Keep tabs on you all throughout yeah. these – throughout your runs, you know, Ooh. throughout the race. So, yeah, my family has been – extremely supportive that's amazing i think my sisters have been to every single race besides one i mean they have flown that's cool. hell yeah, yeah. Man, i mean they're behind it dude. they've flown to bethel they i mean the, oh that's awesome they've drove to uh for the yukon quest start up in two rivers i mean they What's well, just a good reason place. to go out there and check out these places that you would probably yeah, never go. go. And then they're like, shit, we had a ton of fun. We went and checked out, you know, whatever, these restaurants or bars or shops or local yeah. breweries or whatever, you know, yeah. kind of turns into a little weekend vacation, you know. And yeah. then totally. going to Bethel and exploring around out there and, you know, seeing stuff that they never would or, right. you know, never would think. That breaks up the monotony of winter. And when you can, you know, get out of town yeah. for a weekend and go do stuff that you normally don't do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just sitting your ass at home. Yeah, and it's probably nothing but miles on Alaska Airlines. It Most of the time, of those yeah. Places and, the, and, and the flights are open. Whether but what about where you, st where you stay? I mean, they, they got, got hotel hotels. Motels mm -hmm. and stuff? Yeah. Okay. They got hotels in all these places, and Airbnbs are popular everywhere now, you know? Oh. Yeah, that'd be the way to do it. Yeah, if we got any listeners out there, hit us up. We're trying to come to the known. Anybody want to hook us up with the headquarters? <laughs> <laughs> Love the after party. <laughs> Man, Gnome, it, for the I did a rod finish. I heard it's a party. It's like Vegas, but snow. <laughs> I mean, it, it is wild. I've heard that. Snow Vegas? I've heard that. <laughs> it is wild, man. I I never... I didn't imagine it. I, you know, I heard the the rumors of like, oh yeah, you got to come to Nome. It's a ton of fun, you know, big party, all that. I mean, that shit is popping. Yeah, dang, that makes me want to go even more now. 
Yeah, I know. That sounds like a lot to of To figure fun. it out. I've never been so drunk in my life. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you deserve it, man, after all, everything you go through. And and they got all these bars just lined up down the street, you know, so they got, what, the breakers and the BOT and the soap and suds. <laughs> and, yeah, one of them, the soap and suds, it's a laundry mat during the day, and then they got, like, a bar. bar and they, night. they serve, like, fried chicken. <laughs> or I think, yeah, it was, like, fr- I don't know. I'm too drunk to remember. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> yeah, it's like fried chicken or something was good. Oh yeah, I bet. Out of a laundromat. <laughs> you know it's clean. <laughs> Got that tide downy fresh smell, you know. <laughs> yeah, all I've seen of Gnome is like, you know, watching like gold shows and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. you know, and that's probably a, definitely a skewed view of what yeah. it what it really is. Yeah, and that's gotta be its most popular time of the year as far as population of people in the town people flood in man yeah Yeah. oh i bet from all over the other villages and stuff oh and then not only that but you have all the friends and family of these mushers and Mm. from all over the world and that from all over the world and then you have fans and tourists and like people that don't even really follow mushing but they're like shit let's go to Nome. you know like i've never been yeah historic part of alaska let's go check it out i did a rod you know it's so it's uh and there's a lot of history there as well you know and there's a lot of cool things to check out and there's beautiful scenery there i mean you get it outside of gnome and i mean yeah i gotta know somebody out there man sure i do i have to look through the world some great hunting out there and fishing and fly in yeah Mm -hmm. get that big 70 incher that's where you get the big boys huh (laughs) (laughs) that prehistoric looking you know yeah (laughs) Yeah. Well, speaking of that, so when you're mushing and all that, you don't have time to go hunting and stuff. No, you just I wish. focus on that. Um, I tried to do a little bit of trapping this past okay this past winter, and um, I'm kind of new to it. But that that's a cool, interesting kind of art to learn. Yeah, trapping. It's like a one really, of those really other challenging. like lost kind of things that are kind of dwindling. You it know. really is, and there's not too many people out there doing it. I mean, it, what it seems like, at least from what I'm seeing, you know, and the the region of Nanana, where I, I train out of, used to be a big, you know, fishing, trapping, hunting, yeah, dog mushing, and now, I'm shit, I'm the only one out there in the Minto Flats running dogs. I'm the only one putting in trails. You know, I mean, there's very few travelers out there and no one's really trapping. I mean, there's a couple of guys, I think maybe two guys out there kind of trapping in the area. But I mean, well, it's just, what would it's you just say kind of dying off. How, how many uh, like it's a lot of work, though? I mean, you're yeah. putting in trails, you're setting traps, constantly yeah, checking on Yeah, I just them. don't know that the drive is there uh, anymore and, and the, the price for pelts and stuff. It's yeah, just like it, not, it, so it's not it, like a lucrative business like it maybe was it would have in the to last be a hundreds hobby. of years. Yeah, a hobby. Yeah, it would have to be a hobby. Yeah, a um, time-consuming and relatively expensive one yeah. probably too. Yeah. For zero to little return. Yep. Because that's probably yeah, the, why it's like yeah. the price of fur. I mean, yeah. Like well, that's just like it's not lucrative. extreme like fly fishing. There's no return. No. You know no, what I'm saying? No, you're just no. spending. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all for like a picture. Mm-hmm. You know, because mm-hmm. you're not like eating them or anything. You're just kind of like getting after it to be out there and just yep. be be a yep. part of nature and be out there, which is awesome. Yeah. Or what Can't guys? Put a dollar amount on that. Guys flying their planes around or whatever. You know, I mean, yeah. it's just. No return on that. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just an Alaska, expensive hobby. Alaska life. Yeah. Yep. So, and I mean, I don't know. There's nothing too much more Alaskan than getting out there and trapping. Yeah, you know, no, I that mean, is true, man. Wolves and wolverines, and I mean, and it, it, and it, there's an art to it, and there's a lot of details um, that I've, you know, I guess have kind of scratched the surface and... I've gone out with a couple of old timers, you know, and each time, obviously, I learn more, and you know, they're just kind of showing me the basics of it. But yeah, yeah it, it's it's pretty cool, you know. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, kind of based off your original question there, Daniel, was um, so you kind of start your training in like early September, mid September. Yep. And you're running around. I know you're out in Nana, and you got the crew out there. 
Do you guys get a break for like a weekend or maybe a couple, four or five days? We got to try to go get a moose and put some moose in the freezer just for the, just for the crew out there. I mean, no, not, it, it, just no time. The, or the like, life of dogs is because basically right now I got a pool of 18 dogs. So I'm training 18 dogs. So I'm running two nine dog teams. So r- Basically, September 1st um, on an every other day schedule. So each mm. day I'm running a team. And the one then, day the rest in, rest in, and then you're doing the yep. other team. And then when I'm coming back, I got to stock up firewood. So I'm cutting firewood for the remaining part of the days. I'm getting the property ready for winter. Um, yeah, because that's clutch time. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. getting meat cut and food stored and things stacked and just, you know. I'm sitting there fitting necklines and tug lines and, you know, because we make all that stuff, mm. you know. So the necklines that hook the dogs to the actual main line of the sled and the tug lines where they actually pull, mm. you okay. know, what they're pulling off of. I fit all those by hand. Oh, wow. I, I make all those. And, of course, like through fall training, you're breaking things. And oh, okay. dogs are just psychotic at that point to run. So they'll just chew them and, oh, you know. yeah, they're just hard on the gears. yeah. They're, they're ballistic, you know, a bunch of radicals. So um, there's just a lot of daily chores that you're doing from 6 a.m. all the way to 10 o'clock at night, basically. Yep. And to, the thought of to go get a moose is is great, but the yeah. time, to time to actually go and get it and, yeah. you know. Yeah, I just think about being out there kind of in the prime Butcher it up, type yeah. areas and stuff. And it's a moosey country. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah I bet could. it is. And they're back on the rise there. They, because I think, you know, several years ago they opened it up and they, they did some different, you know, I guess tags out there where, you mm-hmm. know, and it kind of knocked the population way down. And now they're, I've seen it over the past three years. I mean, it's really climbing up. Yeah, you're seeing more big bodies standing yeah. around out there. Yep. yep. That's cool. Has that there been good. any, um, I know we really got into the gear talk last time we had you on, um, which was, you know, two years ago. Has there been any new innovations or some new bag or coat or tent or something that you're like, man, I upgraded to this and it's it's amazing? Are you still kind of running the same, same I'm stuff? I'm still running a lot of the same stuff. I mean, the rab parkas and rab undercoats, mm-hmm. to me... There's yeah, nothing are, better the ones. Mm-hmm. that protects material. Yeah. That's the best shit on the market. Okay. Um, also, uh, and this stuff dries out really quick. I, I like the Rab also com- uh, down pants. Okay. And then also those mountain hardware compressor pants as well. Those dry out super fast. Um, and they're warm too. You know, I wear those in more moderate temps. The, as far as the boots, I still wear the Lobins. Um, and I've been wearing the same brand of socks, and they're called Fits. F-I-T-S, Fits. Um, and they, to me, it's like they're heavy expedition hiking, you know, winter sock, wool sock. And those breathe the best and keep my feet dry. I don't remember you talking about those last time. Warm. Yeah, I didn't remember the brand. Oh, okay. But... Fit socks are, I really, really like those. Mm. Um, and that's huge for what you're doing is foot health. Yeah. You, you get a, I mean, because there's different wool socks that don't breathe as well. Oh, yeah. totally. Yeah. Because of the knit, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And also the materials. Yeah. Some are like the darn toughs. They are real tough. Yeah. You know, they're a durable mm-hmm. sock, but yeah. it, it's a real tight knit. Mer- Merino blends. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they're kind of more elasticy, and it mm. just, they don't, I don't know, they don't breathe as well. You get a lot of moisture, and yeah. obviously with moisture, it's going to get, sure. you're going to start freezing. The application's not quite for mushing. Yeah, I still yeah. like the Patagonia uh, base layers, you yeah, know, okay. they're uh, polar fleece yeah. base layers, you know, I, I, I really like those. Yeah. Um, and then those gloves, those mitts that I use, obviously you can't buy them anymore. They're the same insulation they used to insulate NASA spacesuits. And the guy that was that I could go back and look at my notes. I remember taking some. Yeah, notes the on guy this. that what was the name of those? 
So Midnight Sun Mushing um, was a gear company, but they no longer make gear. And his buddy worked for NASA, and he ended up getting, like, just a limited supply of this insulation that they use for NASA spacesuits. Yep. And, I mean, this stuff is freaking incredible. I wear these gloves with just a thin military green wool liner in them, and I wear it at 40, 50 below. And I've camped out at 55 below. Do they look like and, that? Is, it, is this them? Well, so. Or is that something different? It's a similar look to that, but those don't have the that insulation. That, that NASA, the NASA shit. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it's the NASA space heat. man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's pretty much going to be the extreme of the extreme. And above this stuff, the extreme, it's incredible. <laughs> you, if there's any moisture in NASA them, insulation. Or? <laughs> I'm looking for, hey, Kevin at Barney's, we're sweet. looking for that NASA. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when are we going to get a so jacket he had a with buddy. NASA insulation? You know, he had a guy, worked at NASA, got him this material. He ended up making a handful of products out of him. I got lucky enough to, you know. Come get, across a set of those mittens. To get my hands on them. And, I mean, it's crazy. If they get wet, you turn them inside out, leave them on your sled, all the moisture goes to the surface and it just frosts up and you just brush off the ice. Oh, wow. And you stick them back in there and your hands just warm up. Crazy. Instantly. Oh, that's mm. crazy. It's yeah. the greatest thing I've ever <laughs> I've ever seen. Wow. What, what temperature is that? <laughs> I mean, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> well below freezing. Yeah. That's crazy. That is crazy. And that's then like awesome. with those rat parkas too, I, I yeah. hang it on the back of my sled. All the moisture goes to the surface, brush it off. Yeah. Nice and toasty. Oh, I was looking at the... Um, we it's expensive, but it's... You yeah. know, you can't sure. put a price on comfort. Oh, man. Well, <laughs> and survival. Yeah. Yeah, the rap park. I want to look at that real quick. Yeah, they have like yeah, a bunch of nice stuff. Yeah, they do. They got Very sleeping nice. bags too, don't they? And then as far so, as the bags, yeah. feathered friends, there's nothing better. Made in America. Yep. <laughs> yep. I went Hand to that crafted. store in Seattle, man. It was... You better have your wallet ready. Oh, is it spendy? Up in there. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's worth it, though. Everything I mean, it starts at 250 1000 bucks for like a 60 below bag. Yeah. But I mean, and it's worth I've, it. te I've tested it out and I've put it down just on the straw Yeah. with the dogs. And I mean, you're, you're nice Good and to toasty. Go. Stay warm. And I, I just wear my base layers in it. And yeah. Maybe one of my down coats, but. Yeah, for when you got to get on go pee and stuff, you know, yeah. you're not in your skivvies. But it, it's it's comfy. It breathes really well. That's like the big thing for me is the breathability of mm -hmm. that Pertex material. Yeah, because you're moving and because you guys, I mean, you guys know how it is when you're out hunting and all yeah. that. You, you guys get in a sleeping bag and then you wake up all damp. Yeah, because that material is not that breathable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does happen. Yep. Is the Rab uh, Parker you use? Is it like a down or is yep. it? Yep, it's is, a down. Okay, is it this one here? This style. This yellow? That, or is it more like the... um? That's their expedition or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. It, Next step up. It's yeah. similar to that. You got a bunch of fur around yours, don't you? But yeah, I got a Wolverine rough on mine. Does it come yeah. like that or you had that? that no, I that? had that made. A lady in oh. Galena made it for me. Sick. Yeah, her husband's a trapper and uh, she makes rough, so... Yeah. Wasn't there something about the Wolverine? Well, it it doesn't um it it repels moisture, so it yeah. doesn't ice and frost up. So yeah, that's why a lot of guys wear them as hats. Yep, because it it repels the moisture itself. Yeah, it freezes and just flakes off. So it's the only fur that actually really does that. Yep, yep. Oh man, the full onesie. The full ones, bro. Go, go full, <laughs> go full <suit>. Harper. <laughs> like Harper's Patagonia suit, man. Jeez. Yeah, that thing's awesome. She goes ice fishing in just the full onesie. I'd feel athletic in that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that'd be tough to use a bathroom. Looks expensive. Yeah, that would let's say twelve hundred bucks, thirteen hundred bucks. Mm. But I, I think Shit, my parka though. was. Oh, it's fully puffed. Oh, you said Pertex. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I've, I probably, because when we first started the show and we were, we were putting the, um, we were flashing the images, 
during the show and we like bring it up in our original okay. edits. I'm yeah. pretty sure I have a file and I had pulled that rab jacket that he was using. I like found it. it took me yeah. a long time to figure it out, but I want to say I have like a file with some images of yeah. the gear from our show because I did a bunch of research afterwards. I don't need people copying my swag. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no. no. Yeah, no. no, no, no. Don't go look it up. Get your own swag out there. Well, and you know what? Good luck to any of them that want to give it a shot, Eddie, because it's like... Are you not, the youngest? It's not easy, right? Are you the youngest? It, as far as what? The mushers? Like... I'm definitely one of the younger mushers in the in the race field, for sure. Mm. Um, and I'm definitely one of the most inexperienced mushers in the field. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I only started racing two years ago. Yeah. You know, it's only going to be my third year racing and I'm running Iditarod. So, which is not saying that's extremely uncommon, but it's, it's a fast progression. It is a fast progression. And then also to have the, you know, the success that I've had in these races. But, um, yeah, it's, it's moving along quickly. Yeah. I'm excited. Watch that. Yeah, I mean, it is right around the corner. It was pretty cool, the timing of, of having you come in tonight and to get to talk about it, because it is like, I know it's just still early August when was we're recording the show, but, like, it's, the, I hate to say it, man, but, like, the winter's breathing down her neck, man. You can, like, feel it in the air. You can, it not is. that it's, like, getting colder, just, it's just, like, I think as lifelong Alaskans living here with the seasonality of it, you feel it. You're, yeah. I feel like you're like a wild animal. You just yeah. sense it coming. You just know, and then you're like, "Well, shit, it's in the forties that night." Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it was yeah. a little chilly last night, but and we're all going hunting. You know, we're all going hunting starting next week. Yeah, by the time this is out, we're going to be out hunting. Yeah, you know, all of us are going through sporadic sheep hunts, coming back off the moose hunts, and then you know we've got elk hunting in October. Like it's going to just end up being an August through basically. November hunting season because we go for deer in the sound and yeah I mean it just it's kind of crazy we were just joking about this the other day how like hunting season like 10 20 years 15 years ago was just like September I was like we went moose hunting now it's like now it's year <laughs> it, well, round it, yeah well it just yeah well it is that we but wish. I mean really <laughs> really it, it, full time hunters it starts <laughs> yeah. like August first ish yeah if you get that youth hunt out. august 1st and then the caribou and the sheep yeah. open the 10th depending where you're at and then the moose on september and then you get into the deer and elk and then yeah. if you're doing a bison yeah it just turned into like a three four month thing versus just trying to you know your mind's just wrapped around like this one little like 25 or 30 day window where you're gonna do it just yeah quite. well speaking about that i mean eric's about to go on the first sheep hunt oh yeah first yeah. sheep hunt How's uh, the gear gathering? Um, you know, Brandon's been helping me out a lot with that. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually okay. went and saw Kevin Dana yesterday, and he, he really helped me out picking up a good set of boots. Oh, nice. Yeah, he, he was very knowledgeable. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. And, man, he has every single piece you need. If, like, you need to just go to one store. I was talking to my uncle who's coming up, and uh, I'm taking him on a, on a moose uh, caribou hunt. And he's from Jacksonville, like, so I'm like, I sent him this list of all this stuff and he's like, oh, uh, well, uh, I was like, do you guys have like a Cabela's or any, he's like, no, he started naming, we have like a Dick's Sporting. And I was like, yeah, they're not going to have what you need. Yeah, so when you get up little. here, we're going to go to Barney's and you're going to find every single thing you need. Yeah, get him his socks, get him his stuff. Everything, everything, everything. from everything. some stuff sacks. Yeah. Stuff sacks, yeah. Gloves, fuel, tracks, food, yep, food, yep. backpacks. Gloves. I mean, that's a cool little store. Dude, yeah, it, it's he has so much. It packs a lot of shit yeah, in there, it's dude. It's freaking cool. Yeah, and, and one thing I always commend his store on when I go in there, dude, it's fucking stocked. His walls are full. He's got gloves. He's got socks. He's got like all the sizes of jackets. Like it's like not just like onesie twosies and like yeah. Oh, I got a couple extra larges over there. He's got fucking stuff in there. Like more. I went to Sportsman's today looking for something, um, and they just are just demolished. Yeah, There's like depleted. nothing in there. Yep. You know, and then I went into into Barney's the other day, and like you said, it's just packed. Yeah, I just watched that reel, dude. And then Eric goes in there on a Saturday. What, just the twilight days of the sheep hunting season, you think you go into a sporting goods store and they would not have a size 10 boot. Oh, he had multiples. That's what I'm saying. Like, he's like, stock is king, baby. Like, he's ready for this guy 
to walk in three days before and a that's hunt. what i told him i got three days i ain't able, i don't have time to break shit in he's like this is what you want then bam 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 i was like yeah. all right let's why are you wearing them yeah, I break them in. Dude, you should guess. be tromping around, breaking them <laughs> in, man. Could be, man. You're going to have blisters for days. Oh, yeah. I'm <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I was no a good boot, you shouldn't. Yeah, no, they're yeah, comfy. He, he got him a, a nice set of Brickstall Krispies that are, like, pretty much out of the box. They're pretty rock solid as far as, like, a, a bulletproof-ish boot that won't fuck your foot up too bad. Um, plus, I anticipate on this hunt we won't be doing a lot of – in and out of water crossing, I think it's going to be pretty much if our feet get wet, it's going to be from precipitation. Gotcha. I'm not saying we're not going to cross any creeks. I'm just saying I don't think that we're going to have a lot of where the boot gets wet and your foot's wet and you're hiking long distances and you're kind of walking your boots dry where you, you, you can start to have that slippage and some stuff when your feet get wet and your socks get wet. Yep. I think is I think we're going to have pretty much dry feet the whole time. I mean, knock on wood. Hopefully it's but not a it, monsoon out there for you guys. Yeah, we were just checking the weather, and it looks pretty promising too. Um, again. Even though so for a break-in, like that yeah. stream crossing and getting it wet one day, I mean, obviously not the day of the hunt. Yeah. But beforehand, just like to like cinch those things to your foot. Yeah. I think is nice. It is. It is. I mean, it is actually, in my opinion, a good thing to get a boot soaked and then wear it soaked for a few hours and then like let it loosen up and then cinch it back down. So it's almost like form fitting itself to your foot like a like baking a hockey skate. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably a good comparison to it. What um, are these uh is it just like a leather and Gore-Tex? Yeah, yep. Actually mm -hmm. Ital Italian made. Ooh. Yeah. Well, they make the the finest things. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. Well, like you're probably the only dog musher that has that wallet right there. What? I guarantee it. Probably. What brand is it? That's Gucci, it's baby. Gucci. <laughs> <laughs> with, with Ben Franklin's in it. Yeah, yeah. I got the in there. <laughs> Shit, that mushroom's paying good. Thanks to McKenna Brothers Paving. Yeah, they, they write my paychecks. <laughs> paying for all this expensive no, equipment. That, that crispy boot, man, I tied it, and I tried the Loa. That mm -hmm. one just held, like you're talking about slippage. Yeah. So that Loa felt like my Danner, where it moved, but that crispy had like my heel locked in. Oh, yeah. And my, and my that little arch. It was badass. Yeah. That's what yeah. sold me on them. I, I got a pair of crispies that I've I've fucking torn up. Like they're good for maybe one more season. And uh I feel like I'd love to see a little bit more um uh, ruggedness out of them, but as far as just like pure comfort factor and like the confidence in just the boot not gonna tear it not feel like it's going to tear your foot up is huge man because if you start tearing your feet up it, it gets pretty miserable it seems like that's where you got to kind of compromise you know like yeah the comfort yep yep yeah and i figured if, a real rugged boot is going to be a hard you know yeah and i figured you know as much mountain hunting as eric will be doing he could get you know four or five years out of those boots yeah. i'd like to believe and what do they run 400 bucks yeah is that well, what they were is that bad. the price yeah. point is so Which is a very I I mean it's it sounds like a lot of money and four hundred dollars is a lot of money, but when you're talking about Italian specialized mountaineering and hunting boots, like Hand that's a real yeah that's like a really good <laughs> well because a boot can be upwards of seven eight hundred dollars for a set of boots you yeah. know um, so that like three hundred fifty to like five hundred dollar price point it can usually still get you a really really good pair of boots whether it's Loas whites what else did you try Krispies on? the Loa the Loa yeah he recommended. Uh, three boots for the quick non-breaking. Okay, mm -hmm. for what I was mm -hmm. doing. So yeah, what was the third one? Do you remember? It was yours, the brick stall, the crispy. The, yeah, the brick stall brown one, and then the, he the black one with the orange laces. And then yeah, the the, the brick stalls. The th those are both brick stalls, but the black one is like a little stiffer. Something other because of the stiffness. Yeah, okay, so same brand. Two oh, okay, two crispies and then one loa. Lift your mic up a little bit. Yeah, I've tilt, heard that those crispies are pretty much ready to rock. Right yeah, the they, they are really good boots, man. I mean, they're... Which ones do you have? I have a Scarpa. Um, what's the one I got? We just did our deal on the boots, too. I know. We did a review on them. Yeah, go back and check the... <laughs> check the notes. <laughs> Whatever. Well, I was I was trying to tell him to get the, the new Scarpas, um... But I'm sure Kevin was thinking about your, your you know, away. lack of a of time frame to break them in and wear them. So the Scarpa probably would have been a good move, but because you kind of need a boot to just like throw on and get up there right now, it, 
he, he made the right choice. Gotcha. He, well, I don't think you go direction. wrong with any of those that he has up on no, that wall. Of course not. No. It's just a matter of like what you feel feels Preference. good when mm-hmm. you get in there. Yeah. So what are you guys wearing for shells? Uh, outer shell, like rain. Yeah. Um, man, I just, man, I just, I got soaked on on my Q. I got soaked last year on that hunt. With the Yukon? Um, with the Yukon jacket. It might be because that jacket's already like 12 years old. You it's, guys ever use like the Nick Nick's wax or? Yes. Oh, no, mm-hmm. I've done that. Yeah. I've done mm-hmm. that. So I switched now. I, I'm bringing a Sims coat. Okay. A Sims raincoat. That's yeah. a badass jacket. What, what are the, do you know like the materials on that? Or if they're uh, like a Gore-Tex shell or they're. Yeah, yeah. Shit, I'm, I'm just running Gore-Tex, man. Yeah. I got like the super light Sitka um, uh, downpour uh gear and it's just gore-tex yeah and, and then I, are you i guess i mean you guys wearing far as under layers like you guys layering up or do you have a down or oh i have a system so mm-hmm. like my base layer is a merino wool um and then from there i have like a lightweight uh like a thicker merino i go merino wool pretty much the whole way okay and then i go with the thicker merino wool like hoodie style uh-huh um and then on top of that i'll have um like a synthetic jacket uh that's a lightweight jacket and then i'll also bring a down vest and then i got my puffy and then i i'll go with the raincoat that's like my tops mm-hmm. that i bring um i I th- it's almost i don't uh i'm always looking for new stuff man i got my eye on that new uh stone glacier just put out a new uh puffy coat there's like a black one mm. which is i mean it looks i mean there's nothing wrong with the coat i got now i could still use it for years but i'm just like oh, i gotta switch it up you know for yeah no reason well, whatsoever. And, and, well and stone glacier's got some cool and innovative new shit that they've come out with too yeah so and they have the pertex <laughs> layer they have the yeah. Pertex on the outside of theirs, and it is has it, that waterproof down. Is it that, uh, the? because they got, like, the Pertex shield, which is, like, completely waterproof, and it's really breathable mm-hmm. waterproof. You know, it's like a Gore-Tex, but mm-hmm. in my opinion. It's got the DWR coating. E- and even, even better, you know, mm-hmm. more breathable. Um, <clears throat> and then they have the, the Quantum, which is more of just, like, a water resistant, so it's meant to be kind of like a fair weather Okay. If you're wearing it as an outer shell, more of like a fair weather outer shell, okay. or it's a really good underlayer, you know, highly breathable, still water resistant, you know, yeah. but not waterproof. Yeah, I have a OR jacket. My black OR puffy jacket has that Pertex shield, and I got that a long time ago. I mean, maybe when that like that Pertex stuff first came out. Uh-huh. Um, Do you so like it? I, I love that jacket. I love that jacket. And it's really nice because sometimes with those puffy coats, um, the outside layer is pretty thin. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you're in a really windy condition, sometimes you can kind of, that wind can kind of cut, cut through. through. But I feel like that Pertex is just, like, almost like a wind block. Yeah, and that those OR jackets, I actually have one, and I really like it as an, as an undercoat. But it's got the Quantum, so it's – like a wind resistant and a uh, water resistant material. Then they have the shield, which is like windproof and then waterproof as well. And actually, Rab makes like a lighter down jacket that has that shield material. So mm-hmm. it's not like the big heavy parka. Yeah. So it's more of like a midweight jacket, but it's got the shield on it. It's meant to be like a an outer layer, okay. but it's not as heavy as a down. But yeah, still I like which one mine is. It might be the. I, I never I mean, thought that it was like w- waterproof, you know. Be, but I, it's probably the other one then. Yeah, it's. The, I I know exactly what what jacket you have because I have it as well, and it is the quantum. It's the resistant. Okay, you know, but like they make one with the shield, and it goes into a stuff sack like that. You know, size of Packs a beer can. Tight. Yeah, mm-hmm. like the size of a beer can, basically. I was just checking out shield. some of their products right here. They're pretty sweet. Shield Pertex. Yeah, we were just actually, Eric and I were just discussing that. We just went shooting this afternoon. Mm-hmm. And uh, just in a monsoon, like 30 mile an hour gusts. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not quite I- ideal range conditions. But no. Although they are kind of more realistic, you know, because uh, you can't always depend on a controlled environment when you're no, for sure. 6,000 feet, you Good know, training. trying to get a trying to get a sheep. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we had a good shooting session. So where exactly are you guys hunting? Uh, we're going to go up to the Talkeetner Range is okay. where Eric and I are headed. Yeah, yeah. To give you some idea, that's, 
you know, it's a relatively rugged spot we're going to go. Um, definitely good sheep country. Not not crazy, crazy extreme. I went into some six, 000, six to 7,000 foot stuff last year with Chad, and I don't anticipate we're going to get into that, although there is a couple spots. So your four-wheel sheep is, I guess, till uh, you can't. We're going to get in there somehow, some way. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. But uh, <laughs> that north but, of Anchorage and somehow, somehow. Yeah. Way. Upper Huffman has some great sheep hunting areas, you know, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> along with snow machine, fly fishing, Leading all of the above. Goose chases. <laughs> yep. Um, but uh, yeah, we were just talking about the gear thing because, you know, Eric has a pretty good set of gear. He's been moose hunting yep, and deer hunting and, and doing stuff. Hasn't done much mountain hunting, and what he has will definitely work. And so, was, the the conversation has been like, man, you can just go spend three thousand dollars today and go to Barney's and like go get all the stuff you really need. But like, you already have like some puffies, you already have some merino, you already have some like down vests and some lightweight rain gear. Like, man, you don't gotta have a fucking seven hundred dollar pair of rain gear yeah, for this. You'll survive. You know? Yeah, like. <laughs> We'll be good. We're just doing a pretty short run. We're not going for, you know, a week or anything like that. But and so I think what will be good for Eric on this trip will be he'll use the gear he's got and it's going to definitely do the job, but he's going to learn like what works, how it packs doesn't. in a backpack and undoing it and how it gets wet and dries out and all that stuff. We run into those conditions. So he'll, it, it's hard to like, it's hard to convince somebody of the stuff they need, even though he's hunted and he knows like what good gear is and, mm-hmm. and like, but like, you got to, like, use some decent shit and then use some good stuff to be like, oh, yeah, man. Like, I'm yeah, this is the this shit. Yeah, that. I'm going to just, like, not everything has to be fully gooch, like yep. Kuyu and Sitka. And, like, like I'm going to – I was just funny because he was like, what what you can bring to use this on the other? And I'm, I was putting my gear together this morning. I've got a First Light T-shirt, Kuyu pants, a Sitka uh, light hoodie. And then I've got another um, – I got Kuyu gaiters. And then I've got, like – Sitka rain gear. I got. I'm all over the place. I've like hand selected all these pieces. Yeah, they're not like just brand specific. They're like, I want this merino T-shirt because it's going to serve this purpose in this application. And I'm going to put this lightweight hoodie over that, and I'm going to put a vest over that, and I'm going to put another jacket over that, and it's going to be a system. But it's not like all matching. built through like one brand. It's just like stuff that I've like picked up, yep. used, and, and what like, works for you. This doesn't well, quite dry out as fast. Like I like this thing. I'm going to use it for this kind of hunting or this kind of trip, but for heavy exertion mountain stuff, I think critical is um, heat retention and moisture waking yeah. is, is, is my two biggest things stuff that is going to, because you're going to hike up and you're going to get sweaty. Mm-hmm. So whatever you're wearing, like it's gotta t-shirt, dry out. it's going to get soaking wet. Yep. And I'm depending on that. I can jump in my sleeping bag that night wearing it and it's going to wick it out and it's going to dry. So that the next morning I got a fresh start. Yeah. So, you know, to the system. So we were talking about it and I was even telling Eric, I'm not even fully complete because I haven't even quite figured out because what I've gone and fucked up is I've gone and accumulated so much gear. Now I'm like, Oh man, I got like three puffy jackets to choose from and three vests to choose from. And I'm like, man, I kind of missed it like five years ago. And I just had like one of each yep. and it worked just fine. So now I'm like digging through some stuff today and I'm like, oh, this Merino pullover. I'm like, fuck, I forgot I even had that. I'm like, well, this would work really good for this trip. And I'm like, eh, not this time. And I grabbed the next yeah. piece of gear. And so now I'm almost like confusing myself. Now I'm like, I know what I want to bring, but I got all this stuff to choose from. And well, that's that's part of go. like what you know Eric kind of mentioned was like all oh, one brand specific. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that if you go yeah. whatever you, you can build a whatever brand you go. Way. You know, whether it's Stone Glacier or First Lighter QU or any of them, um, they have the full kit. You know, what I'm yeah. saying from skin to to rain to gear, outer layer. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can go with that. And what's good about that too is like you know that all that stuff's going to layer just right. You know what I'm saying? Whereas if you have a certain puffy with a different brand rain jacket, maybe it's a little tight. You know what I'm saying? Whereas they really try to, within that same brand, try to make Build sure the that rain jacket that goes everything puffy, fits right? perfectly. You know, so it's just like you don't feel constricted in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And I think that's you know they're trying to build an, an entire completed kit. Yeah, you know system. what I'm saying for a person. But a lot of times, like to get that, 
you know, you're talking thousands of dollars to, mm-hmm. to buy the whole thing. Oh, and goodness. a lot of times you'll, you'll find something from a buddy or you'll go to Barney's and get something this day. And maybe you'll get a present from, you know, your mom or something and mm-hmm. a Valentine's or something. And you get this jacket and then you end up with this mix of, you know, brands yeah, and stuff that's, you know, I, I think that's cool. either way. Yeah, I, think I it's pieced cool. together my is, is own that okay? system. Is that uh, I think what's so. What's your guys' opinion on that? I I mean that's I, all I, I run done. everything, dude. I got like every brand. I have. I mean, all you the stuff. you have specifically ran a cool use system though in the past. Like, yes, from skin to full outer layer, and that was pretty cool to see in person, full match, and watch it perform. Not not just like it looked great, but like to actually see it in hot weather, wet weather snow wind yeah and it made it easy because i would i just knew that i was bringing this every time and i and and i think they were one of the first ones to do that because all this stuff that i bought from them was like i don't know 15 years ago 12 years ago like you know i'm saying you know 10 years ago and i just rocked that but now you see a little bit more innovation with this company a little bit more innovation with that company and so you want to just like well let me try that one you know it's maybe a little thicker merino or it's a little lighter merino or it has the hoodie or now they have like the thumb holes and just little thing Mm -hmm. you're like oh that's cool let me let me do that and so you end up becoming mix match you know what i'm saying and when i first started i was like just camo you know what i'm saying head to toe yeah and full, now, yeah. full dark dynasty <laughs> yeah and i'm like oh, I, don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if i like this you know yeah going to the solids now right yeah i like to switch mm-hmm. it up like personally i like to go um camo um gators solid pant camo top so it kind of like breaks it up mm-hmm. so if you're laying down in some sort of in. some kind of rock system or or wooded system whether you're going with greens or you're going with grays it kind of breaks it up and you don't just like and i like to wear my stuff around town sometimes in the winter you know multi-purpose yeah so mm-hmm. you know you're going to the rink or something and you wear your hunting jacket and stuff like, like that I hunt bro yeah <laughs> <laughs> no this dude that's what he said the dude that walks fucking by antlers on my wall <laughs> yeah yeah oh man you get that all the time we were at anchorage brewing the other day and and uh me and brandon and like we had some like hunting stuff and this dude comes by he's i like, mean that wasn't oh, i had a sick of shirt but it wasn't hunting yeah and i think i had like flannel or something i think but, i had a barney something on and and then josh Josh had, Josh had his Barney, had Barney shirt, shirt on, on and yeah. I think I had like a, I don't know what I had. You had an AWP hoodie. Something. He's like, you guys even hunt? He said, you guys you guys even hunt, bro? And we're like, all <laughs> right. Like, what's up, man? But no, he, we had a fun conversation because he was asking about our hunting plans and see how you hunt your mom. <laughs> Day like, and night, what? baby. What? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's actually been fun, like, Talking to him, talking to Eric on the phone about like piecing together the gear. I love that like, talk, man. Oh, yeah, it's I totally like the different mismatch. Me, man. Yeah, like, this whole mountain thing. That I, so yeah, I got everything for moose, right? I got my zero wiggies, but yeah, I'm not gonna bring a four and a half pound bag. Like the thing. Oh, fill like, up your oh, whole backpack. Yeah. The whole backpack, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I, Eric I came over to the to the feathered friend. So I ordered me up a feathered friend. Oh, you did? I did. Oh, yeah. nice. That's that's nice. It came, did light. it come in? It's in now. Yeah, I got it. Oh, and, so, oh that's right. I, you sent me get a stuff it. sack. Yeah. Get a stuff sack for it. it and came, I mean, it came with its own little one. I know, but go get a dry bag. Oh, gotcha. go get a dry bag. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sack. Yeah. Yeah. Find, I mean, find the dry bag that oh, that fits shit. in. No, I was telling you about the 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 compression into that. Yeah. Yes. And it'll because I mean I'm. I'm assuming. Go to Barney's. They just have like, them there. Okay. Just this, like for this, me, packing. Yeah. It, I mean, smaller the better, lighter the better, obviously. Mm-hmm. So those stuff sacks are killed. Yeah, you're, you're packing very similar to a mountain hunt, I'd imagine, where everything has oh, to yeah. like fit in a spot. Yep. Yeah. It, it can only be so much Every weight. Every pound like, matters. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So yep. yeah, and that seat and at Barney's they have the right here, yeah. Know? There you go. Yeah, you know, that's, <laughs> gotta stop it. That, they don't call that pack weight. <laughs> no, no, <that's> not. <laughs> they don't count. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the compression ones that that I like, they have it at Barney's. Is the Sea to Summit one? It's very similar to the wiggy, the one your wiggy's bags on that has like the four to like yeah, linch it down. Has like the cap in the in the bottom, and you can cinch, cinch it down. So then you can really just crunch that thing down versus just the roll top okay. that sometimes it's like uh, so it has the roll top and then it has so how do you figure out what leader that you need to stick that in you gotta just bring it and stick it in it what, what he's well, you, put, you put your bag in its bag that it came in yep. and then imagine it being like a little bit tighter and then you just kind of go from there 
Gotcha. You just kind of no. I've had to do some trial and error. Like I was like, well, oh, it's let me try the small one, and I was like, ah, it's too tight. Let me try the medium one, or maybe and it can go you smaller. And then you use that other one for or another another or another gotcha. application. Yeah, because yeah, I just, use like I put my forty below feathered friends bag, and they're like, I think it's their large size or whatever. And I mean, it it packs tight, and I just yeah. put it in the nose of my sled, and it's stuffs I mean, in there good. I don't know. I think it's four pounds or does, something. Does like it have that. Pertex? It's got the Pertex. <laughs> fully coated, <laughs> full, full coat, and full coat. Yeah, yeah, it's nice though, man. I mean, it is really enjoyable to sleep outside. Yeah, just yeah. I mean, you're outside, outside, no yeah. tent, no nothing. I mean, and I've used it, and I think that the coldest I've actually used that bag in is probably like thirty below. But wow. I mean, it's it's comfy. Yeah, you know, I mean, comfy enough to where you pass out and you're not waking up and you're not shivering, shivering. and you're mm-hmm. not waking up damp and cold and yeah. Well, you don't got to worry about rain, you know. If you the moisture you get would be snow, if anything, but it's not like it's frozen. It's not going to penetrate into that material. Yeah, but it has not, the coating though. It's got the coating it's in got case. The rain. It's got yeah. the shield, bro. It's yeah, the shielded. The shield. Fully shielded. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a little bit of like a advantage on how we're gonna go about this this trip. We're gonna probably establish like a base camp. So our thought was to kind of like get that set up. And what kind of tents are you guys using? Yeah, we're gonna get a we're gonna get a base camp set up and then have the ability to like um, kind of regroup and figure out what gear we actually want to leave and bring. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I was kind of like the, our preparation for this wasn't so much more like the Brook style and where we're just going to like bring these things. And then it was kind of like, when we get up there, let's figure out where we're going to go on our first night and then the conditions. And then we're just going to kind of like, I might bring this, I might leave that and just like make the final decision like that day mm-hmm. and not have to worry about like, Oh, I got to pack it all up there. I actually might be able to leave some shit back or, yeah. you know, if that day's hot and I know I don't have to like wear that particular warm gear or whatever, but to your question, so we're, we're going to go with an Alaska guide uh, base camp tent, and mm-hmm. then we're just going to run the teepee. Yeah. And uh, I think we might deal with bugs, unfortunately, because just, I don't know, man. It's just like we've had such a good summer, and just I I feel like it's good. there's potential for where we're going to be going. It's just there's such thick green foliage just down below tree line that, I'm thinking if there isn't any wind that the bugs are still going to like climb up there. Mm. So I think we're still going to run thermocells even though, because the, because the teepee doesn't have a netting, it's on the ground. Okay. And so in, in the past, we've never had to do that. When we go to the brooks and stuff, like we don't ever bring a thermocell and worry about bugs. No. We don't, you don't have mosquitoes and fucking gnats and f- horse flies or like any of that kind of shit up there. So I don't know. I'm 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 more worried about it this time. So oh, yeah, I'm gonna be. go. I'm gonna go ahead and run them. I'm gonna bring them. But you know how it is in, in that teepee, and, and I I run it. We're gonna run a teepee too on our sheep hunt. Um, oh, Jack did decide that he was down I'm just, for it. Yeah, we're making. I'm just. I'm. Not, yeah, I'm bringing, bringing it, it either way. Yeah, I'm bringing it. Um, I mean, I always think like it wouldn't hurt to have like the stone glacier, two men and the teepee, so you could kind of have like. Well, I'm gonna bring both. Oh, you are okay. We're gonna be able to right in there so we'll make that decision but when we yeah. go up i'm gonna bring the teepee yeah yeah uh, um, is that a pretty small pack size or oh yeah the teepee is yeah yeah, yeah it's super like, small it's about it's the small. size of a coffee can okay all said and done it's got a carbon fiber pole and just like five stakes so it, it just light super, super light, light packs the light down small you guys much. have a floor no, no. okay right on the ground yeah well we'll, we'll oh, bring yeah, that's what, that was my next question um, I've been using um, like a nylon tarp um, mm-hmm. that pretty much packs into its own bag. It, it packs to like this, like nothing, like a, like a little pillow. And then that comes out and it's pretty much a, like a, a six foot. It's no, it's like a four foot. It's a four by six. It's a four foot by six foot long. So then I'll just lay that out on my side of the teepee. And then um, that doesn't let water come up from the bottom. Okay. And then you can lay your pad down and your sleeping bag and all your gear and stuff like that and not worry about it getting wet. Um, that's what I've been using. A lot of dudes, um, I know Cisco actually would bring a tarp tarp, you know, one of those little four by six tarps that you can buy at AIH or whatever, like the legit brown yep. on one side, silver on the mm-hmm. other tarp. A little heavier, doesn't like, it's pack nice because, yeah, it doesn't pack as tight, um, but it's definitely more durable yeah you know what i'm saying than that little thin thing which you might be able to rip um 
and then we were talking with Chad, and he likes to use, um, what did he say? You put it on the outside of the house as uh, um, your water protection. What's that called? Um, it's like white. Mylar? No, oh, no, it's, um, dang it. Um, like the, the Tyvek. Black stuff? Oh. Tyvek. Tyvek. Yes. Tyvek. And so a lot of the dudes use that. So they'll just cut out exactly what they need, a four by six or whatever. And then you can just fold that up to basically like a notebook. So the Tyvek tape mm -hmm. you can get at a hardware store, it is the best tape to use for patching up any of your gear, oh, especially oh, your down gear. Okay. Um, you can run it through the washer. I mean, you can have that shit on there for like 10 years. Really? Wash it, dry it, don't matter. That stuff is sticking. Is it clear? Staying to it. Yeah, it's the white. Okay. White Tyvek tape. Okay. Yeah, we've been using uh, for that stuff is the Tenacious tape, which is pretty good. I never heard of the Tyvek tape, but that makes it sense because that's what yeah. they use in yeah, like. Man. It works phenomenal. Yeah. Best stuff I've I've used. And then also. Yeah. Um, Didn't even know you could even get that. For small, minor tears, especially even like in Gore-Tex shells i use that aqua seal okay they yep. the, like that glue yeah and then so i just take oh. that and i just swipe that on anything that's got a tear or a cut or even like my uh climb bibs yeah i've gotten like tears in those which is kind of hard to do because they're pretty durable but mm -hmm. i'll just i'll aqua seal them up that's a good idea i always take, bought that like, for patch. on the raft trips take because your, that's what you use to like repair a raft yeah but i didn't think about like like just pretty much closing up that yep. gash or whatever and then yeah. just sticking that on there like you would a cut you know exactly like super and then let it like dry second and skin almost type shit. no it works really well and yeah. you, like i said you can wash it whatever and it yeah, yeah it works it extremely like well. a layer so like there. that's what i've been using that's what i've yeah kind of discovered because i don't know you're limited and you know so i'm like ah oh, fuck it you know put some try of some of that mm -hmm. and it actually works really well holds up so, yeah, yeah now they start selling um i mean they got patch kits and little you know type things like that where do you buy something like that a hardware store um i actually uh, beaver sports and fairbanks so like you know i train and live in nana all winter so i yeah. go up to beaver sports and it's kind of a i guess a locally owned yeah. you know been around been store. around forever yeah mm -hmm. and uh so like i'll get it there i guess you could get that kind of stuff at rei or the tyvek tape Oh, Tyvek? Oh, yeah. go to any hardware store. Okay, hardware store. Yeah. Go yeah. to Lowe's, Home Depot, AIH. I mean, they'll have it. Yeah. And then you can put, like, that Aqua Seal around it. So, like, if I ever tape anything or you use those, like... Uh, oh, and then you just put, like, a layer those, around the edges? Yeah, if I bead. use those, like, little sticky Gore-Tec type patches, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, tenacious kits, tape deals. Yeah, I'll... I'll uh, I'll aqua seal around it, and then that way oh. it never unravels. From yeah, the edges. bulletproof. There you go. It's like mm -hmm. putting a caulking or something around it. Yeah, because I use those patches a lot to like seal dry bags and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But yeah, they do, if, especially if you're like, if they're like, you're rubbing on them, or there's some abrasion going yeah. on, they'll like start to lift. Yep, and peel. If you use that, the like, stuff a lot, you know, it's yeah, gonna, it's gonna yeah. wear. Yep. Another trick on that is I always will like round it. Like round the corners, so it's not gonna catch on anything. So yeah, oh, like if you grab use and like flip, flap mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. Yep, and if you use like duct tape, mm -hmm. cut the edges, the corners off, and yeah. round it, and then yeah. uh, put a little gasoline. Oh, that oh, like, like, like melt it, like yeah, melt it on there. Yep, mm. a little chemical reaction. Yeah, nice. you should, so make sure you pack some gasoline. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Just a little, <laughs> make sure that's out gas too. <laughs> <laughs> Are we gonna be packing gas? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> on that note let's take a shout out to the sponsors <laughs> the treehouse ak your one-stop dispensary located at 341 boniface parkway be sure to ask the bud tender about their deal of the day because honestly there's always something good on deck and guys listen this is where the culture lives at the treehouse their dedication to servicing consumers has been developed through a lifetime of involvement in the cannabis culture they're committed to providing the highest quality products at whatever value your budget affords, while always maintaining the deep-rooted principles that have carried them this far. Their focus is on relationships over transactions, and you can always depend on them to treat you with the respect you deserve. Hit them up at thetreehouseak.com, and remember, you must be 21 years of age to enter their store. 
Tailored Restoration, 24-hour emergency home services, helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Tailored has an emergency response number with trained professionals available to help you at any time, day or night. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Make an appointment today at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Since 2008, Serrano's is Anchorage's own new generation of Old Cocina. Their menu showcases the passion and love of their rich heritage and unique family recipes that have been passed down through the generations. Serrano's goal is to embrace and display trad flavors using the best ingredients that are available. They focus on making everything from scratch daily. In-house menu includes handcrafted corn tortillas, salsas, carne asada, and chorizo. But don't take their word for it. Experience their tradition and some bore for yourself. Locations on Tudor and Northern Lights, both with new tequila bars. Check out their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. The Connoisseur Lounge, located in the heart of Palmer, Alaska. The Connoisseur Lounge is Palmer's first locally owned and operated cannabis retailer. Their beautiful store is located at 226 Evergreen Avenue. The Connoisseur Lounge has exclusive cannabis products such as Snowcap Romance, Aurora Haze, Super Glue, and one of our favorites, Sugar Cookies. And if you're not into the flower, the connoisseur can hook you up with edibles, vape supplies, and a ton of CBD options for all your health and inflammation needs. Check out their daily deals at theconnoisseurlounge.net, or even better, stop by the lounge today. Remember, you must be 21 years of age to enter their store. I mean, that would add like a a big time like bulletproofness to your like kit, especially in the in the TP, because when it gets really nautical, and if you if because you have to be really, really like calculated in how you build like your rock walls and stuff around it to block wind and, and maybe sideways rain mm-hmm. that'll want to come in. That even to the point where you'll start stacking your bags and gear up against the edges to kind of seal it but off. But the bivy would be cool to to be under there because then you, if there was any moisture swooping in underneath or well, we had the homie like that went full soul on us. <laughs> <laughs> A little premature. You know what little, the soul is. The That's sub- another thing you need to get to, Eric, is the is so emergency this, blanket. Yeah, I'll pull it up real quick. Yeah, it's an emergency blanket made by Soul, which I believe means survive outside longer. Um, let me see if I can get this. Is that like a bivy sack or is that? It's yeah, it's similar. like an emergency bivy. Okay, there so is. there it is. Um, get the image right there. Yeah, like a, I got one of those. Yeah, to the right. Er, there it is. Yeah. You, so you guys bring those in too? And it's, it's like this big, dude. It's tiny. It's like the same size of your blow up camp pillow. Yes, if you it's have half the size of that beer. Oh no shit! Yeah, and so and that thing will yeah. go open up all mm-hmm. the way and pretty much you know if need be, hopefully you never need to use it. Um, you can put your sleeping bag inside of that thing and just be what we call sold out. Yeah, it's kind of a <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a one time use type, you know. Yeah, you yeah. can't get it back in that thing. Dude. Yeah, <laughs> as hard as, as hard as the homie tried. <laughs> yeah, he like busted it out and got in that thing, and it was like. And we're in our bag looking at them, and we're like, ah, kind of seems, critical, seems, a, seems a little premature, <laughs> man. Like, all right. Hour later, dude, he's like, is this hot? sweating, you know, peeling out of it. And like, man, I told you it wasn't that cold yet. But <laughs> but you know what you could do? Um, if you have already, uh, Eric, um, a little two-man tent, um, a lot of times the footprint that comes with that two-man tent or like your footprint oh, of your marmot that'd tent, be perfect. that's like the same nylon um, mm-hmm. material, material and, that you can use as you're too. in the teepee on uh, your side. Gotcha. Yeah, that's you know that's, what a, that's a good point. Yeah. So you might already have one of those. I know you have one with your marmot. I do. Yeah, I, I have two of those those nylon tarps that we use oh, that okay. pull down. I'm I'm just gonna bring the second one for him. Yeah. So we'll have those layered. In. And they there's something about those the size of them because they're like um, they're actually bigger because we fold them in half, don't we? Yeah, I want to say they're like nine by nine when they're open, but when you fold them in half. They're like four and a half foot wide by like I don't know maybe like lengthwise or maybe like six foot long. When you no, they gotta up. be longer because I don't go over the edge and there's room at the bottom. Yeah. They're like the perfect. It just seems to fill the inside of that that, that uh, teepee up perfectly, and so that like when you put your sleeping pad down and then you put your bags down, you're like there's no ground around. Yeah, there's what no kind like of it's all, are you guys using. Uh, we got those Thermarest. Uh, are those aero aero lights? Neo air. Neo airs. How small do those pack? Um, <coughs> About the size of a Nalgene bottle. Yep. 
Yeah. A, a two liter Nalgene? Or one, li- one liter they're, uh, they're insulated for R, six, whatever. Six, six, six R rated. Six R. And yeah. are those yeah. like you blow them up yourself, or is it a self air, or is it? Um, you blow it up yourself. Yeah. I mean, it says you could. S- s- that doesn't work. Doesn't work. Oh. Well, you know, it comes in the bag that it's supposed to be stored in. You can haul with you, and then you can like it has a little hole in it. You can put it over the mouthpiece, and then like you can like you make like a basically like an, like an air bubble with the bag, and it like compresses and then pushes air into it gotcha <coughs> i don't know it takes like 30 seconds to blow it up real quick i don't you know i don't mind just like unrolling it and putting it together so don't take long to just blow it up yeah i just do it a little lightheaded you know just kind of like but yeah so you get your that? buzz on up there mm-hmm. blow up your pad way to get a buzz <laughs> Shit, okay so this, is, oh, so this is the one we have it's like the lewis and clark one it's called yeah that is it, and we got it at Bass Pro. I mean, I don't know if Barney sells something like that. I'm sure they, I'm sure they do. Well, we got them years ago, and the Sportsman's I think had them or whatever, and they're extremely handy. They pack down nothing, and and you could use them. We actually used it on our sheep hunt last year as a lean to. Yep. Um, because we had no mm-hmm. other tarp with us when we, me and Jack, were on the side of this mountain, and this just monsoon came in, so we busted that thing out, and it has the little grommet holes, and we just used our our hiking sticks on on two ends, and then just like um cinched down the back end, so it was just like a little mm-hmm. lean to the thing. weather off of you. Yeah, and it works. Mm-hmm. It's it's waterproof and good. Yeah, and light. You're gonna want that because you don't want to be right on that rocks yeah if you're on top of a mountain you're probably it's just all like shale you know what i'm saying you don't want to let you just some kind of comfort to put in your pad on i mean it could still rip it but you just feel like oh yeah it's, it's, there's a layer well, it's just a vapor barrier it's something between you and the ground you know if the ground's damp yep. or wet or just even no, huge. E- even just the critters and bugs and like spiders and stuff that are crawling around the rocks underneath it, it's just nice to put something in Getting between you and that big even if it's only like because I sleep a on mill- straw. A millimeter and a half. And yeah. it makes a world of a difference. Yeah. And like putting your bag down on the snow. Right. Versus like putting it down on a yeah. layer of straw. Yeah. yeah. It absorbs heat, right? Yeah. The straw, I mean, like. It's just a nice barrier, you know, barrier. a nice layer mm-hmm. of insulation. Yep. Do you just repack it up when you leave or leave it there? How does that work? Like once the, you lay it out and you're done for the night and you're going to move bag? on? My bag? No, the straw. The straw. Oh, the straw. The straw gets, it just stays. It there. stays? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, so like at checkpoints or at checkpoints, they clean it up, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. But out in the yeah, middle Yeah, that's of just nowhere, part of nature. It's just, I mean, it's Maybe you should bring a bag of straw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, those fucking Anchorage boys are here. The straw patches all over the place. Some spruce boughs. <laughs> Went up to 6,000 feet and I saw a patch of straw. I mean, what was going on up here? <laughs> I'll bring the sheep right to you. <laughs> they love for feeding on that. So your guys' trip is what a seven night? Yeah. Damn. Man, you guys got you're going on a long one. That's I did a rod almost. Yeah, yeah, that's a real. Well, I and feel short like for any, me, I wanted to do like a ten to twelve dare. Well, when I, so in my experience thus far, which is not a lot, but once you've eclipsed that seven day mark, man, you got to bring so much food. I, I am excited that I don't have to bring so much because yeah, like ten some, days of food's a lot of weight. Oh man, a lot of weight that takes up the whole bag, dude. Yeah, it's just like a wiggies in there, but it's food. <laughs> it's not a joke though. It is that. I mean, no, you bring all lot. those those freeze dried meals, and you 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 know you kind of precisely stack them in a in a stat in a sack, and then like you know for me, I've got all my like bars and and you know candy and like jerkies and cheese and. All that shit, and it's like, it is, I think I waited alone one time, and I, I had like a 17-pound pack of food for a trip that we went on. I was like, I want to say it was like eight nights, and uh, I think I went out of there with like one dehydrated or one freeze-dried meal and like a couple of like rations of trail mix left. So I ate all of it, mm-hmm. but it was like, but you know, you're packing it in and out of your bag every day, and you're just like, dreading taking this gigantic heavy bag and like sticking it back in your backpack like uh but by like day five it's halfway gone so you're like yeah. all right yeah this thing's starting to lighten up <laughs> <laughs> you got uh, your freeze-dried food ready yeah i just picked some up nice nice yeah what brand did you go with the peak yeah peak? yeah 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 that's kind of hard to beat those man you do you eat much freeze-dried stuff out on the trail 
I know. Remember how you said you kind of cook some of your food and how you guys prepare so it's some all of your vacuum stuff? sealed. Yeah, because the problem is, I guess we'd have to get some sort of clean water source. Oh, to to boil. But to the make, snow, no, you wouldn't. It'd so probably I take mean, too long. But with and you snow, have to fuel and yeah. So and then the thing with snow is there's always a lot of debris and this and that and shit in the snow, you know. Yeah. It's never clean, you know. I mean, yeah. go scoop up a nice powdery patch of white snow, and y- you look in the pot, and there's you got twigs and twigs and yeah. stuff in the trees and yeah, whatever, flavor. you know. Yeah, lots of nature. So <laughs> yeah, trail spice. The the easiest way for us is vacuum sealed frozen meals, and then we just put it in our cooker pot that oh, we have, okay, because yeah. we, we have to boil snow a lot of times we have to like melt snow or sometimes we can get into the rivers or whatever and uh scoop the water out of there and then we boil it and we dump it on our frozen meals for the dogs you know the frozen Mm -hmm. meat and then that thaws it out because we chip it we have a big meat chipper so i prepare all my meals that way for the dogs um a meat chipper yeah what does that mean it chips up blocks of meat you know we buy meat Oh, so you can kind of compress it like a log? And then it, it chips it up into like these thin little curly slices. Uh-huh. And then that way, once it hits the hot water or even warm mm. water. Oh, it it's just, quick to it, rehydrate. It, yeah, it just it just melts. It thaws yep. out instantly. So yeah. with that same cooker, I get boiling snow or water, river water or whatever is around. And I throw my freezer or vacuum sealed meals into that. And it thaws it out, and then I just eat it out of the vacuum sealed bag. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So all kind of the same. Your yeah. dog's food's going in there. Yours is going in there. Yep. Oh. Well, the dog food never really goes in there. I got a. I take a um, those uh, kitty litter like buckets. They're mm-hmm. like a what is it? Maybe a three and a half gallon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kitty litter bucket. Do you have a picture on your page on the on the food deal? You know. Uh, I got your page up here. So, I I ended up posting, like, a little tutorial. So, I make my cooler out of that kitty litter. I insulate it. Mm. And I duct tape it, and I insulate it, and that's my cooler. And that's where, and then I line it with a trash bag. And then that's where I put the meat and then the hot water. And then that way, that cooler always stays clean. And then nothing Uh, ever goes in my cook pot besides water. Okay. And then that way, I can put my meal in there. And I don't got a bunch of bloody meat. And oh, gotcha. Mm, you know, gross, so yeah. it just, that kind of keeps everything clean. The kitty litter bucket keeps a, a meal warm for about six hours, you know, if I need to. If I need to pack like a, a meal for the dogs, which I, I don't really do because it's a bunch of unnecessary weight. And frozen snacks are plenty nutritious and for the dogs, you know. Um but if I needed to, if I was in a situation where I needed to, those kitty glitter buckets, that's what I use. And then you can stack two. Within it itself. Within itself. Then that way you always got one for hauling water. Mm. Because, like, let's say you're at a checkpoint and you got to go inside a building and they have water in there. You can take, you can put all your food in one and then you can take the other one out of it, you know, and go in and haul your water and. Yep. And then you got a clean water bucket, you know, so that's what I do. Do you uh do you have a YouTube System? page? I don't. Just start one. <laughs> and do all those little things that you do out on the trail when you heat up your food and I know that they use a lot of heat, right? Yeah, so I use heat mm-hmm. and that's how that's my fuel source. Um like the actual like yellow bottle. Like what you heat. use for your yeah. engine, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. Well, probably people in lower for eight, they're like, heat? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. So, it, yeah, actually, I'll pull it up. Um, separates uh, s- separates water. the water, water out of the fuel. fuel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, it's real safe to use. So, like, I'll take my bottles of heat. I'll dump, like, anywhere from four to six or sometimes ISO, eight. ISO, that's the good stuff. Yeah. You don't need the ISO, just the yellow stuff. Yep. And then uh, you dump that in there at the <laughs> bottom the of my cooker. And then I'll take like a little bit of straw and I'll dip it in the heat and then I'll take my lighter and then I'll light the straw on fire and throw it in there, you know. Yep. How long does that how long does one of those little bottles last? Like so like burning? I dump 
like like I said, four to six in there. Okay. And then usually that will get me. I can have boiling water within twenty minutes or under twenty minutes. You know. Mm. Yeah. Ten minutes, somewhere around in yeah, there. Depending how cold it is, or yeah. Whatever. If I'm melting snow. Oh, okay. If I'm melting okay, snow, yeah. if, I, if if I'm actually getting cold river water, then I mean I can have boiling water pretty quickly, and then I can dump that out, and then go get more river water, and then uh, boil it, and then put my food in there, and then I eat. So I feed the dogs first, and then I cook my meal. Mm. And that's probably that's <clears> such a unique Alaskan thing. I think. I mean, maybe Canadians and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people think that. To so we never, do it that never way. heard of that. You What's never that? heard of that. Never heard of that. No, cooking with heat. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So for people that aren't aren't watching, it's it's H E E T, and it's pretty much a, uh, a antifreeze fuel thing that you would add to like your snow machine or your four wheeler or, or your truck mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. if it's been really really cold and you feel like water got mixed in with your gas, and so you want to put it in there that that will like pretty much evaporate all yep. the water and then you'll be able to turn over your engine yeah i like so to throw it in a you like guys a don't think that stuff like when you're snow machining and stuff i you no, i use it in the boat pouring the gas tank oh not, okay not, like ever never thought about like cook it like cook, cook, light it on fire, fire. Light it <laughs> yeah is it a weird smell when you no. burn it no no not at all mm. i mean th- i know that's a really big like dog mushing <laughs> deal mm-hmm. like that that's what all you guys do that's what we all use mm-hmm. yeah and then, yeah, it's the vacuum-sealed meals work great, and you can put anything. I mean, obviously. No jet like, oils? I got lasagna. Yeah, no, and, yeah. That, we asked them that before. They, no, no one uses, like, no jet MSR oil, reactor green, or, or any of that stuff. Because that's just one extra thing to carry. Like, yeah. we have to carry a cooker to yeah. cook our dog's food in. Yeah, you know? so you might as well use it to so make it So we just use it to cook our food. Yeah, and like a jet boil would be one It's a multi-use thing. piece of equipment that exactly. does everything versus... But I mean, I would. I was thinking like carrying one of those just to like make yourself some quick coffee in the morning when you're kind of like getting into the groove. But you probably use that to cook your water to make your yeah, coffee. Yeah, and, and then stuff so like too. in our drop bags. So like for caffeine, since I drink coffee every day, if I don't have caffeine, like I'll get a headache. Oh, me too. You know. Yeah, you so like it. do like the five hour energies or something. You know, just to kind of or oh, even like okay. little caffeine pills. You know, mm-hmm. too take those or have you have you tried the jelly beans i haven't yeah i got eric uh into those uh chad got me into those electrolyte caffeine the jelly bellies yeah you can buy them in like larger bulk i'm pretty sure but you like you can go to rei or you, i'm pretty sure uh, did barney's do you get some of the smaller snack stuff i uh, i was checking around there last time i was there i didn't know if i saw them but um they come in like a small pack there's probably like a dozen jelly beans in there and they're oversized so they're like larger than a regular jelly belly okay Bean, but they're packed with caffeine and electrolytes. The ones I use are like mints almost, they're like the size of oh, a little mint. Like mm. a tablet? Yeah, and it's like a little Tic Tac <clears throat> container basically. Mm-hmm. And then that's that's what I use, and I just stick it in like my chest pocket. And then once a day. You just pop them? Yeah, once a day I, I use them. Yep. Because like, I don't know, I think even like on the Cusco I didn't sleep at all. You know, it's 300 miles. Mm. N- no sleep. 200 mile race is definitely not sleeping. Um, but then like the Kobuk 440, you know, it's 440 miles of traveling. So you have a night where you sleep. So I slept, I think like two hours during Mm. that whole race. Just naps. So two hours and like a 68, I think, or somewhere around in there, almost 70 hours. Did you ever fell asleep out on the back of the sled? Yeah, I nod out sometimes. Sometimes I'm like... And I don't have a seat on mine. I don't run a tail dragger. And that's like the back compartment, and people mm-hmm. will use it as a seat. So I have <coughs> not run a race yet with a with a seat. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so I'm always standing up. But obviously you get a little tired out there, especially mm-hmm. like when it gets dark and you're like on towards the last, you know, stretch of the race and you're going into maybe like your last checkpoint. It mm-hmm. seems like that's when you're – kind of hitting the wall a little bit. And yeah. That's where I'm, like, kind of nodding out on the sled almost. And I'm like, oh, shit, you know? And then it's like, <laughs> yeah. start trying to kick and run. And you've been yeah, kicking and awake. running and, you know, working your ass off. And you're out in 20 below, 10 below. I mean, if you're out there in the elements for days on it, you know, for several days at a time, you're, 
It takes a lot out of you. Oh, man, totally. What about uh, drinking water, like, for you? So I have a thermos, and mm. I, carry, I carry two thermoses. Um, I carry a smaller one, mm-hmm. and that's what I drink out of. And then I have, like, an emergency one that's, like, a bigger, thicker thermos, and that will keep, like, warm water for, I forget the brand of it. But I freaking love it because, like, on the Cusco, it kept w- hot water for three days. Oh, wow. And so I mean, super it, insulated. It thermos. stayed in my sled the entire time. And I didn't, I didn't run out of my actual little thermos, you know, because mm. I bring that into the checkpoints. You know, if we got an indoor checkpoint, I'll bring that in, get, get hot water or whatever. I'll do, like, a 50-50, you know, mm-hmm. hot and cold. And then whatever, the s- smaller, lighter thermoses will keep it warm enough you know to where it's not freezing up on me and i can Mm -hmm. drink it on my you know 90 mile runs 100 mile whatever you know 10 hours at a time do any dudes do like a camelback style no i don't i mean i just like where it's directly between maybe their jacket and hand so it wouldn't freeze you would yeah you would have to wear it under that uh that parka but i just think i don't know i mean it might work for some people but yeah, I wouldn't want that. You haven't extra, seen it. Though. I wouldn't want that extra, extra stuff like, on you. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. A bag of water on your back would be kind of weird, right? Yeah, just a sack. Well, right I there. mean, that's what we do when we're hiking or hunting. Well, I mean, I could see a guy having like maybe like a custom little like harness or something in between your jackets that you put on, and you could run your hose through, and insulation would keep it. Yeah, like, I mean, thawed they, I, out I, or whatever. I, but, I think it would work, you know. Yeah. But yeah. I think just like having that. On your back and the extra straps just more and all weight, that. It's more just kind of, yeah. that wears on you after a while. I and mean, if you can imagine like doing, you know, 90 mile runs or mm-hmm. 80 mile runs or whatever, you know, 10 hours at a Jumping time. Jumping on and off the sled and yep. dealing with and your it's dogs. It's just kind of one more thing to take off and put on and yeah. strap up, you know. <clears throat> yeah, totally that. Simple is, I, I don't know. It's just the simpler it can be, the better. You know, like, I yeah. don't wear that many layers. I got a, what, one, two, three, f- four layers total, you know? Got mm-hmm. my base, my fleece, a mid, puffy, and my parka. Yeah, pretty simple yeah. system. Yeah, and it's extremely breathable, extremely warm. Yeah. And dependent on the temps is what I base my mid layer off of. Yeah. Well, that's where it gets a little more complicated, in my opinion, and some mountain hunters might be like, yeah, you're overthinking it, but... Um, your, your changes in, in your layering, but by day or even by like the time of the day, some days it's like you're starting early in the morning, you're all puffied up. And then later in the day, you're doing something more exerting. So now you're like peeled down and now you're, so you're just constantly layering up and down. Mm -hmm. And that's where, um, having that like layering system dialed in on mountain hunts is critical because you, you are constantly changing like what you're wearing and when so it's yeah. kind of like tough you know you can't just like throw on those that four layer system right in the morning and like you're gonna wear that all day long because you're peeling it back off and putting it back on and oh the sun came out oh shit it's getting cold i'm gonna throw that on and then so it seems like for like a fall hunt it would be like more of like a maybe a three layer system you know mm, yeah yeah like moose hunting yeah yeah yeah, glassing like, is... Yeah, it would be like a three, it's, three it's kinda, layer system. Yeah, it's kind of similar. Like, you know, at the end, you just throw a pup, a nice thick-ass puffy on. Like, we have these Wiggies Anorak, like, pullovers. Mm-hmm. And when the wind is just, like, cutting, no matter what you wear, it's just cutting. You know, you just throw that thing on, throw the hood on, throw some puffy gloves on, and you're like, all right, I'm good now. Is that insulated, those? Or is that just, like, the rain... Oh, it's insulated. Oh, it is. Yeah, okay, it's, so it's, it's different than the rain. It's got the um, it's got the uh, lamellite fill oh, that's in the sleeping bag in the in the jacket. Oh, I it'd be great those. to bring like on a backpack, hunt. It's just so damn big. That's yeah, big. Just too big. It's too big and bulky. That'd be good on like. Uh, I don't know why it didn't happen. Those guys rock them yeah. wiggies jackets. So that's where they're like, flying them. In I the think camp. like that lighter weight, like Rab. With the actual shield on it, that's waterproof and windproof, and it stuffs in a sack like that. You know, oh, I'm nice sure that would stuff, be ideal. Know? It'd be in those kind of conditions. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's that nice. Anorak one, like let's say you're on like a float 
hunt and it's just freezing in the morning oh, and you're man, not moving perfect. you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying but you keep that thing on there just, yeah. just and it's pouring right you know what i'm saying so you ain't getting out of the weather yeah and just put that you're thing just on. stuck in a spot yeah yeah that's nice i've never seen those i've only seen like the poncho i want to say it's more like a poncho mm-hmm. they have a poncho and it's called the they poncho. quit making them oh they did yeah oh really to look it up Oh, wow. It's not on the site anymore. It's no probably a good thing we went in there and dropped like $1,000 that day and got yeah. all that gear that just lasts forever now. Yeah. yeah. I want one of those anorak insulated. I love the awesome. I love Are those waterproof too? mucks. Those are the best. Oh, yeah. I want a pair I, of those. I still wear those. The what? The the Wiggy oh. Muck Lux. They're like a booty? Oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. You wear them in like your sleeping bag? Or just, oh, you're or, talking about like the camp booty. So yeah, which it, ones are you talking about? They have those. Those are nice. Um, and I like to wear, like, a camp booty for sure. Mm. Um, so you can have, like, those wiggy ones, or they make a, plenty of other down-type, like, camp booties to wear, and yeah. then I can let my boots dry out, you know, and I wear them in my bag and all that. And um, But the wiggies makes a muckluck, an overboot. So I put my Loban Norwegian boots inside the wiggies, and, like, those are the warmest. I mean, if you're going in 50, 60 below, I mean, that's what I would put well, on my feet. those over. Yeah. And they're really light. Really, really light. We Do you guys ever close. wear, like, over boots? Like, a, uh, for, mm. I guess, if you have a lot of water conditions or anything like that? I haven't. I know people that do bring those things, sort of river crossings and stuff like that, the, like the knee-high ones. I mean... They're yeah. almost like, yeah, like a, a hip waist boot. hip boot, yeah. But I haven't, I haven't got into most a lot of those over. I, I, I would for like a, a winter caribou hunt, or if we did that mm-hmm. bison or something like that in the winter. Lobens makes a uh, it's a Norwegian military over boot, and I mean, they are extremely light, and they're waterproof, very waterproof, and it seems like that would be maybe like something that you guys could utilize. It because it, it, it packs to nothing. It's yeah, extra, I mean it doesn't weigh a thing. Yeah, and you just slip your actual boot into this waterproof, and it comes up to your knees. Yeah, you know, gives you like a knee high boot, a knee high boot. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. I see and it's I extremely see it. light. You can strut around in those, and it's real breathable. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I've seen them. Um, yeah, the TV turned off there. But yeah, lost connection there all of a sudden. Yep, technology. Sometimes it sucks. Yeah, I mean, there's still a lot of room for, like, uh, adjustments and experimentation for us as it pertains to, like, equipment yeah. selections like and, and applications for what we're using. Yeah, I mean, like, all the years that we've done some, like, you know, 80 creek crossing switchbacks up riverbank or riverbeds and stuff, pretty much just ran our boots with our boxers on with our rain pants. Mm-hmm. And then we would just get soaked, and then we would get to camp wherever, and then... they dry out? Yeah, we'd just... The boots over another... Of course, of two or three days, you'd walk them out dry, assuming the it's not raining. That doesn't always happen when it gets wet. But the rain pants, you hang on your trekking poles for three or four hours in the wind, and they dry right out. You ever use, like, the seal socks <coughs> or those... Yeah, uh, I, yeah my brother I've has. He had it. those um, seal skin, like, knee-high socks mm-hmm. that you put on, and he wore those on some wet thing which your feet will definitely be dry those are 100 percent waterproof yeah. i yeah. just actually bought um i was showing you those gloves at barney's mm-hmm. um they have um their seal skin is the brand and they're they look like mechanic gloves those mechanics gloves that are like rugged and they have the padding on the outside which i think you've worn before on a deer hunt but they're 100 percent waterproof and they're like have a little insulation in there but they're tight they're not like big old gloves they're like can't and you can still you have got dexterity like the, the impact knuckle guards and stuff that are on them who, who makes that um was it the seal skin seal skin, oh. seal skin and they got them at barney's huh yeah so i just picked up a pair that for like you know really wet like they're probably awesome for the boat when you have to like get your hand Handle on the, wet ropes in the and water stuff. and the ropes and all that stuff because you still have, have grip and you still have mobility but then it's waterproof gotcha you know yeah, that's what i was thinking eric was like handling wet ropes and stuff on the that's boat what, that's what your boy's for 
<laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> well, while you sit inside with a warm cup of yeah, coffee, yeah yeah, 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 pull that line, pull that line, go ahead, get that anchor. <laughs> well, even on like, like long like ATV rides where it's mm -hmm. really wet, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, and you wear you want still to be able to grab stuff and move trees out of the way, mm -hmm. and you wear those grab mechanics gloves, you know, yeah. or those soaked. leather gloves, but they get all soaked and your hands get cold. So I'm gonna test these. I haven't I haven't proven them yet, but they look legit. I'm gonna. Are they got test those orange out. ones that are all rubber? If you guys, use yes, those? yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but those you can't do not. You, you're like a <laughs> yeah, those <laughs> atlas gloves. Yeah, you can't. You can't really do or much. Those. Oh no, I have no, those no, little no, no, those little thin ones. Yeah, yeah I use those for just, ice fishing. They have just like a thin mm -hmm. yes. orange fleece type yes. liner yeah. in them. Yeah, they're great for like uh, shrimping. Yeah, those something ones. like that. Yeah, because you can the glacier glove you can't you can do shit in. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just like <laughs> it's a neoprene <laughs> freaking <laughs> finger. Sausage. Yeah, no, not the big sausage ones. Yeah, yeah. These ones are real like form fitting, and I feel like yeah. With them. I, but I, I have a pair for ice fishing. I, use I got those. you. Yeah. I know some mushers, especially like if we're expect, expecting a lot of water, even if not water and it's just real cold, they actually take just like the little ice bags. You know, the ice bags, they say like ice bags, what actual, you know, if you were to buy ice from the gas station or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. They take those like 10 pound ice bags and they put those on their bare skin foot, feet. And they kind of cinch them up, and then they put their sock over that. Oh, yeah. They okay. put their wool sock over that and then slide that in their boot. That's kind of like what my dad used to make you do with the cars, plastic Safeway bags. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was little. Slip these in some Yeah, put watch. these on I mean, there and then put your boot on, boy. <laughs> yeah, some people, I don't know. Some of us swear by it. I have yet to experiment with it, but. Yeah, that hmm. would work. Just straight plastic over I mean, the foot. It obviously doesn't breathe, but it retains all the heat yeah you if know. you're not moving a lot yeah keeps your feet warm yeah and dry ish you know just put one of them dry bags <laughs> <laughs> you could do that <laughs> stick it in there yeah i haven't really like thought about bringing a lot more like footwear besides just the boots and and some crocs on a backpack and truck Croc was, and yeah put them in for, four wheel drive or pretty, oh they're in four wheel drive a lot <laughs> yeah, they are put that strap on the back <laughs> you know not when you're doing little pee breaks and stuff but no i mean just like you don't want to wear a lot of sh or you don't want to pack a lot of shit yeah and keep it light and i still do i Simple. bring too much stuff anyway so i gotta i gotta cut where i can <laughs> i was looking at all my shit on the table this morning i'm like i'm sure the more you go still the less haven't you figured bring. out well i you'd think You'd think I I have like deleted some things and added really? some things. So I'm like I feel like I'm not really ever deleting much weight. Like I'm with a rifle and a pack of water. I'm still 75 pounds, and that's like a fully loaded three liter, you know, bag of water, rifle, mm -hmm. ammunition, all in the bag. The whole gear, everything said and done is like 70. I'm yeah. like, it's too much, but I don't know any other way. You need to get your numbers down. Yeah, I do, I do, but I <laughs> tell you, I, I, I use every single piece yeah. of equipment in the bag. I mean, it's like, well, you, you use it or not, you yeah, know? And it's you're like, ready to suffer somewhere, whether it's eating or, or warmth. Yeah, or and the food, is, the food is like, you know, do I have to actually have like three King things size to eat all bars. day, you know? <laughs> Where's your oh, bag? No, that, what do you weigh? Uh, I think he lies, so no. don't believe what he says. Uh, <laughs> I'm about sixty. <laughs> Ten pounds, that's a lot. I think yeah. these dudes when I'm telling when I'm like, Yeah, this is how much I weigh and they're like, Oh, I'm like ten pounds lighter. I'm like, Are you guys putting your rifle on? Yeah. No, I do. It all. Like, oh I know you do. I'm just saying, like I always give you guys shit. I'm just like, Where's it at? But uh You bring a lot of food. Which is fine. Yeah, you eat I it do. All. I do. I go into a sheep hunt knowing I'm gonna suffer on food. And you know, because I, I mean, could, I don't really I think could I lose some pounds. Much you know what I'm saying? We all could too. lose a couple pounds. So I figure that's that's the. Diet. I mean, after the first year, you guys were bringing just the same shit that I was, as far as like stepping your game up with the non breads and the meats and the cheeses and yeah, you know, the full size candy bars. Because what <laughs> what kind of fun is the little Halloween candy bar, dude? That's not yeah. fun. Just one little snack and tease yourself. <laughs> so where are you skipping then? Breakfast or dinner on the mountain? House? I don't really eat breakfast. Yeah, I don't really eat breakfast. Um, I don't. I, I. I don't know how I'm lighter. I don't, I don't bring as much care. food. I definitely don't bring as much snacks. Yeah, I definitely don't bring as much snacks. Um, but I make up for it in creamer. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on, you know. 
That's yeah. what I'm saying. I don't know if I trust these guys with their weights, dude. I give them true. I give the true true. Yeah, I don't, no, I'm not. I don't, I, I, I'll, I'll lay it out and show you if you want. I mean, everybody laughs at me and shit when we go, and then, I, then we get our packs on and we go up the mountain, and I'm like, well, you all got the same shit I got, so I don't know where the difference is really. I mean, I bring a few things. Like, I'll bring a Leatherman. Do you fall behind? No. No, he's normally in the front. Yeah, no. Yeah. I do I'll bring quickly answer that question. <laughs> 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 Hell no. Maybe day one, I kind of like, I pace myself hard. Yeah. I don't push hard at all on the first and second day. That's important. I just pace, 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 and then finally when I get like a good break in, I know like my knit ligaments and, and joints and everything are like, you can kind of just feel your body and know when you can push it. Yeah. Then that like third and fourth day, and then I can just start like just putting the- Start the, motoring. Yeah, put it down. That sleeping bag probably adds a couple pounds. Oh, that's 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 huge. Yeah, everybody's running a, probably a, a sleeping bag that's two or three pounds lighter than mine. Yeah, because I run a wiggy sleeping bag, so that's number one. Totally, mm-hmm. that's a good one. Is is that? And you um, bring like an extra jacket sometimes. Mm, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess I, I guess I have one extra layer. You bring an extra. I don't bring an extra layer of nothing. But then I don't bring the shit to sleep in like you guys do either. I just sleep in my clothes. Yeah. So you're just so one pair of pants the whole time. You guys time. bring pajamas? Yeah. No. No. I, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> I, I, you do, though? I, no, I bring um, compression, like thermals uh-huh. that I'll wear at night in the bed. Gotcha. And then when I get up in the morning, I still have them on coffee until we get ready. And then, so for my sleeping, I will only wear the compression um, pants and then like knee high super thick merino socks that will only be for sleeping mm. um but yeah one pair of pants one pair of everything and then what your bare chested you got to because yeah, you don't want to wear your nasty no pants no on. i wear a long sleeve merino <laughs> i'll wear the long sleeve merino and a vest if Chest it's cold pubes and all <laughs> yeah yeah no, if it's hot i will but i, I like to wear a vest to bed shorts. because you have mobility in your arms so i'll wear like a long sleeve merino and then like a, my puffy vest so that it's like if it's gonna be cold, yeah. And so then when I because I turn a lot at night and that way I don't get all like bunched up with the jacket. Like Brandon's in there with this full puffy, like totally just. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sometimes I mean I'll wear it all. Yeah. Yeah, I can't do that. If we come in all wet and cold, I'll just get in my bag with all my gear on. Yeah. Just I mean, not the ring gear, but kick my boots and ring gear dry. off, and I'll just like whoosh, slip in there. I like to let it get warm and breathe and dry out, and then I'll peel it all back off and stuff it away and or stiff, stuff it down at the bottom of my bag so it's just in the bag and warm. The worst thing you could like do my is, boots. yeah, like I always mm-hmm. take my day pants if I'm not wearing my the pants I'm wearing all day out hunting. I'll, if I'm not wearing them to bed, I'll at least roll them up and throw them down in the bottom of my bag so when I got to put them on, they're not just like this ice cold rolled up yeah. pile. You put them on your legs and you're like... <laughs> you know, freezing ass pants on your bare legs. That's what sucks with camping outside, you know, in the winter. Well, you're camping in the winter. That's just a whole nother level. And you're putting on cold, frozen shit, and you're just like, ugh. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Got to move it around and break it loose to kind of get it on. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Well, thanks for coming in, guys, and having a chat with us. Um, We appreciate you guys coming in. Um, Good luck on the hunt. Eric yep. and Brandon, good yep. luck on training the dogs and anyone no, listening out you. there as you're out there in the field. Be safe. Be careful. Um, thank you for all the dudes that have been coming up to us and ladies randomly and uh, supporting the show. We appreciate everything. Mm-hmm. Any last minute comment? Yeah, no, I mean, I liked how you mentioned the good luck part. I know we got a lot of stuff planned here in the next two months. Um, most importantly, is just make it home safely. Yep. That's the mission, right? Like, we want to go harvest an animal and experience and live the adventure and, and go through all the 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 phases of what the, you know, process is. But the the mission really is to make sure you get back to your... Yeah. You, you go out the driveway, you come back in the driveway, you know, every Shit, time. Shit, it seems like driving is probably the most dangerous part of that whole adventure. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> Yeah, you we know, kind of think about all that. The way the highway's been lately, I mean, yeah. there's been a lot of crashes, so. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Logistics are definitely, you know, there's a lot of shit that can go sideways. And that's just why when we're out there, and I'm sure you and all of us, have, we're doing it. You just got to pay attention. Yep. You just got to pay attention and 
think about what you're doing. Take your and, time. But yeah, yeah. Good luck to you and Jackie too. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we're thanks. all gonna go student, start doing our stuff after this. So yeah, so we should have some we'll good stories to, mm-hmm. to tell here on some of these next pods. We'll transition into moose, and then <coughs> we'll go transition into elk and deer, and <laughs> let's keep on rolling. <laughs> uh, full transition. Thank See you, it. Alaska. Stay wild. You remember my speaking to you of what I call your overcautiousness. Are you not overcautious? When you assume that you cannot do what the enemy is constantly doing? The Alaska Wild Project podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. Barney's Sports Chalet, supplying hunters with the best hand-selected gear since 1963. The exclusive home of Frontier Gear, built for the rugged Alaskan terrain. Your one-stop shop for all your outdoor needs. Visit Barney's today at 906 West Northern Lights. Arbor Digital, the forefront of digital assets, cryptocurrencies, and wealth management, providing a low-cost, research-based investment strategy for Alaskans looking to invest their hard-earned money. Visit arborcapital.io today to put your money to work. Tailored Restoration 24-Hour Emergency Home Services, helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Total Truck and Alaska Overlander, Alaska's premier supplier for custom automotive accessories and overlanding products, providing all-inclusive rental vehicles and trailers, custom outfitted to explore the Alaskan backcountry with a unique and convenient traveling experience. Serrano's Mexican Grill, two locations, one on Tudor, one on Northern Lights. The Northern Lights location has their new tequila bar. Check it out. Also see their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. The TreehouseAK.com, located at 341 Boniface Parkway, Alaska's own and grown cannabis and CBD store. Ask the bud tender what the strain of the day is to get your 10% off. The Treehouse, where the culture lives. The Connoisseur Lounge, Alaska's premier locally owned and operated cannabis retailer, located in the heart of Palmer, Alaska. Their cultivated products include Snowcap Romance, Aurora Haze, Super Glue, and much more. Find them at theconnoisseurlounge.net. AKO Farms, located in Sitka, Alaska, built from the ground up with concentrates as their single motivation, with exclusive products such as their sugar wax, full spectrum diamond sauce cards, and more. Ask your local bud tender about A. K-O. Marijuana has intoxicating effects and may be habit forming and addictive. Marijuana impairs concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence. There are health risks associated with consumption of marijuana for the use of only by adults 21 and older. Keep out of the reach of children and marijuana should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. The Bait Shack, located on Ship Creek upstream of the bridge. Can't miss the bright red shack. They are the go-to fishing gear rental and guide service on Ship Creek. Tight lines and fish on. Come hook into the action with them. Hit them up at thebaitshackak.com. Anchor Town Dogs, located on 4th Avenue across from the old 4th Avenue Theater. Look for the blue and gold umbrella. From reindeer dogs to bomb euros, they've got you covered. Anchor Town Dogs, your local gourmet hot dog and sausage cart. Crude Magazine, Alaska-based media outlet using the last frontier as a springboard to discover larger truths about the cultures of our great state. Read more at crudemag.com. Lawn Pro AK, Alaska's year-round professional property maintenance team. Services include snow and ice management, weekly lawn care, and more. Get your free estimate today at lawnproak.com. Double Shovel Cider Company, located off of Arctic and 58th handcrafted alaskan made colonial ciders they also have a tap room downtown on the corner of fifth and e stop by today and taste an award-winning cider lady with a plan your own alaska event planner from scouting the perfect location to planning the tiniest details specializing in event management and production for intimate social gatherings find lady with a plan on instagram should you not claim to be at least his equal in prowess and act upon the claim I say try. If we never try, we shall never succeed. This proposition is a simple truth, and it's too important to be lost sight of for a moment. If we cannot beat the enemy where he now is, we never can. It is all easy if our troops march as well as the enemy, and it is unmanly to say they cannot do it.